great. Okay, we've got one more minute. Nice. And uh, Deb, we were mentioning if you can hear us, uh, reach yeah. out to Darina. Um, but also, if if you want, what you can do is cut your video off and then share your presentation. So do the screen share and just have that running, and that might help with bandwidth issues. Deb, did you email the your presentation? Okay, so just turn off video now. Um, yeah, I'm trying to do that right now. We're we're at 63 participants. Nice. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to session four of the Confluence Watershed Summit. Um, my name is Gary Thompson. I'm the moderator, and I'm going to welcome you on behalf of the McCall, Donnelly, and Cascade Chambers of Commerce, Valley Soil and Water Conservation District, Big Payette, Lake Water Quality Council Incorporated, and the Friends of Lake Cascade. Um, this is our final session. Um, it's been a great run so far. We've got some amazing presentations you can find on our website. And at the end of today's uh, Zoom workshop, we're going to also talk about how you can participate in the future. So stay tuned for that. Uh, this is all part of a longer term planning process, looking at uh, how we can engage in future actions to protect our watershed. Uh, so far, we've been learning a lot about uh, high altitude satellite imagery down to the bacteria that can be found in our water, how rock formations can affect current conditions. We've also examined diverse uses of our watershed and the need to accommodate multiple activities and interests. Um, again, after today's formal presentations, we'll have a longer Q&A piece for people to get, share their input and talk about our path forward and ask questions of our presenters. Um, and bear in mind through this, all these presentations, like complex problems require complex solutions, but mainly also require us to work together. Um, so again, today, how this is gonna work, we're using Zoom webinar, so we can't see all the attendees in person, but if you have any questions, you can post them to the Q&A. We're gonna ask our panelists to answer any questions they can in a few minutes at the end of each presentation. And if there are some questions that are still lingering in the Q&A function, We'll, we'll try and have them answer those directly. Uh, let's see, I've got a note here, fair warning. We're gonna go a little long today. We have a couple of very important subjects and uh, we wanna make sure we give them some time. Um, and again, this session will be recorded for future reference. You can find it on our website, which we'll share at the end of this presentation. Uh, again, we wanna thank our sponsors, McCall Donnelly and Cascade Chamber of Commerce, Valley Soil and Water Conservation District, Mop and Homes, the Star News, the McCall Cascade Store, Big Payette Lake Water Quality Council Incorporated, Pam and Ralph Thier, and the Friends of Lake Cascade. We'd also like to acknowledge the creative services provided by Mikhail McKenzie Incorporated and facilitation services of Redfish Bluefish Inc. These are two McCall consulting firms that have been helping with the summit process. So without further ado, well, let's do this. We'll give our first presenter time to warm up. I'm gonna share a look at our agenda today. Let's start with that. Okay, so we're in our welcome phase. We've got a couple minutes to review our agenda. Today, we're gonna to look at riparian grazing management strategies. Uh, that'll be followed with uh, Idaho Power Watershed Programs. We're gonna look at conserve and protect the state endowment lands. We're gonna talk about the Big Pit Lake current watershed condition and recent monitoring results. Uh, around 11.30, we'll look at Lake Cascade Blue Watch restoration improvement strategies. 11.50 to noon, we'll hear from the, we'll hear about the Valley County Water Management Plan. And then noon, we'll have a quick announcement on zebra mussels. And then we'll finish up with some next steps on how you can partic participate in the future. And we'll have some Q&A for our panelists. Nice. And we'll also part of that future look um, down the road as we'll explain this some more, but having some different areas of interest and in work groups that can then work with the watershed advisory group. So with that said, let's go to our first presenter. Let me stop my screen share. Okay, our first presenter um, is Dr. Melinda Ellison, a livestock specialist with the University of Idaho. 
Dr. Ellison is based in Salmon, Idaho at the University of Idaho Nancy M. Cummings Research Extension and Education Center, where she serves as the Extension Range Livestock and Sheep Specialist. Her research program focuses primarily on associations between livestock grazing management, rangeland health, and wildlife, wildlife habitat. All right, uh, Dr. Ellison, uh, to you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try with my camera on just so you guys can see me, but if I am having any internet glitches, just let me know. <clears throat> and hopefully you can see my screen there. Okay. So I'd like to thank you guys for inviting me to speak today. Um, this is a topic that I spend a lot of time working in. Um, when I started with the University of Idaho, uh, my position was primarily grazing livestock, um, which is continues to be what I work on. Um, and the sheep component was kind of added more recently. So um, I try to tie those things together and, and work as much across as possible. But most of my uh, grazing management rangeland work uh, right now is in cattle. So that's what I'll focus on today. And the reason that I stick with the riparian and music areas for the most part is, of course, because this is a place where livestock congregate quite a bit, uh, primarily because of the water availability and the good green lush forages that are often associated because of that groundwater. Um, also, the protection and shade afforded to these animals uh, because of the willows. And of course, cattle can be kind of lazy, as we all know, so they like those low grounds. And also, the riparian and mesic areas make up only a 3% of the overall landscape across the Western United States, and they support 70 to 80% of the plants and animals. So here's where my focus came in, and primarily because it's such a difficult thing to manage across the landscapes, because of course, as we know with anything range related, it's going to depend on where you are and what kind of scenario you're looking at. But also it's kind of one of those contentious areas to work. And so we, we wanted to provide more information related to how livestock are grazing these areas, how we can work on management to promote good riparian health. So with that being said, we work a lot with livestock and wildlife in these areas. And in my group, we have several things going and I'm gonna to touch on two of them today. The first being different grazing management strategies in riparian and mesic areas um, related to sage grouse habitat. The second being how cattle and other wild ungulates are utilizing willows and how we can maybe use that information for restoration efforts or just managing for fish populations or other wildlife. Um, water quality, that type of thing. And the third thing that I won't talk about today because we don't have a lot of good data to share yet, but that if any of you guys watching are interested in and want to visit about or collaborate on, um, we are working with beaver dam analogs in an area where we're reconnecting um, a tributary to the Lemhi River. And we have not excluded grazing from that area and we're just working on the different types of management to make those a successful story. So um, that being said, the first study that I'm gonna visit about with you guys is that grazing management in riparian and mesic areas for sage grouse habitat. So what we did here is we have several pastures where we either had no grazing at all, um, they were not excluded to wildlife, the moderate intensity grazing, which we grazed to 30 to 40% with yearling heifers. And also with yearling heifers in the other pastures, we grazed to 70 to 80% utilization. We looked at grazing in early June and also later in the season in August. And we grazed for approximately 16 days each time. And this is going to be over a two year period. And the objectives here were to look at how management is affecting the vegetation in the area, the soil moisture, um, the forbs that would be available to sage grouse during their brood rearing time period um, in the late summer. And 
obviously also cattle performance, um, daily gain and that type of thing. So just a schematic of how we were uh, sampling these pastures. We sampled prior to grazing in June and also after grazing in June, prior to grazing in August and after grazing in August. And then we came back at the end of September and sampled again for um, identifying any regrowth um, changes. So to get started, I want to point out first that the two years, 2019 and 2020, were very different in precipitation, which is evident by these photos. These photos were taken um, around the second or third week of August in both years. In the top row there, um, the first two pictures are in August after they were grazed in June, moderate and high intensity. You can see that they had good opportunity for regrowth and it's very lush and green coming back in. Um, after the August graze, obviously this is probably right after grazing, so not a lot of opportunity for regrowth, but at this point you can see everything has gotten pretty dry in that area, and we're probably not going to see a ton of regrowth. And then in our control pastures, these meadows were made up primarily of meadow foxtail and smooth brome. When we first started grazing, they were originally improved pastures for hay fields that have now um, been utilized just for grazing and, and that type of thing right now. So in the second year, a little bit drier, but you do still see a little regrowth from those June grazing periods. And again, in August, things have dried out quite a bit and we're not seeing a lot of green and regrowth happening. Soil moisture, as you would probably suspect, decreases from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, we do, have a continuous pasture that we've compared this with. So you can see that uh, this pasture would have been grazed for um, two and a half months, I believe, or maybe three. And um, as we would expect, we do have that decline in soil moisture across all pastures. So then when we look at the forb cover, this is pre-grazing. So the, on the left here, this would have been the forb cover before we started this trial. And then on the right, you can see how it looked the following um, year before we grazed again. So the interesting thing here to note is that the darkest bars are going to be the preferred forbs, which are the ones that the sage grouse are most likely going to want to utilize during that late summer period, mid to late summer period for brood rearing. And then the lightest colored bars would be your noxious weeds like thistles and that type of thing. So what we're seeing here is that after the early season in June grazing, we're seeing increases in these preferred forbs for sage grouse in both the moderate and the high intensity pastures where there's little change of course in the control pastures. And I'll remind you that with these improved pastures, those grasses are very thick and they don't allow for a lot of um, openings for other plants to come in. So it's a very monoculture type of scenario. And as we begin some grazing, we're seeing that's opening it up and allowing some of those forbs to come in. Um, we did see a decrease in these preferred forbs in the uh, pastures where we had moderate intensity grazing in August. Um, but we did see a little bit of increase there in the high intensity grazing. So I think what's um, interesting to note there is even at these high intensity grazing utilization levels, we're seeing some increase in diversity and it's not just in your noxious weed diversity. So that's very interesting. Um, additionally, where we are seeing an increase in the noxious weed um, area is this control pasture. Um, between the two years. And I will remind everyone that we had more moisture in 2019 than 2020. And so that could be driving some of these changes as well. So this is a post grazing period. Um, so I'll remind you this would be taken um, in the early pastures after the grazing in June and in the late pastures after grazing in August. So again, we see that decrease in these moderate late pastures. But at this time of year, we do see a decrease happening by that time period. And of course, you think about we are grazing them, so they may have been grazed off at this point. 
And in the regrowth period, uh, we look back at the end of September, and here we are again seeing an increase in these high utilization pastures from both periods in our preferred forbs for sage grouse. So it's definitely interesting um, information that we're coming up with, and we're um, we're uh, recommending at this point on a short-term basis that high intensity grazing is not going to be bad for the diversity in your riparian and music areas. And of course we have to look at how um, cattle are performing because we're never gonna affect change if it's not going to be economically uh, relevant. And so this um, chart shows the different gains in cattle according to the year. So in these early season grazing periods, there's not a lot of difference between these round would be 2019 and the triangle is 2020. But because of the moisture, I believe here in this late season, um, in 2020, we did have decreased gains in cattle. And that would translate um, to quite, quite a bit of economic impact to a producer. So the recommendation here from us would be that if you're in a dry year, from both a vegetative standpoint and a cattle performance standpoint, that grazing in that late season is not quite as effective as grazing in June. So the other things that we're looking at, but we don't have any data on yet, are uh, forage quality um, for these pastures. And that would be indicative for both the cattle and the sage grouse, um, which of these options is better for forage quality and also forage availability. So the other thing I wanted to touch on here um, is this other set of projects that we've been working on where we're looking at the way that cattle and wildlife utilize willows in riparian areas. And of course, this stemmed from a lot of res restoration work that's going on in our area and how, um, how do cattle really use these? We don't have a lot of good information on that. So the first thing we did was we took a lot of um, field measurements, which would have been canopy volume and measuring browse by twig length in the willows in these areas. We did a study um, at the Rinker Rock Creek Ranch, which is managed by the University of Idaho in Blaine County, and at the Beeler Ranch, which is down by Ledor in Lemhi County. And we flew that area with drones to identify whether or not um, we could replace this um, tedious on the ground measurements with drone imagery measurements. And then of course we looked at how different animals were utilizing willows and what their behavior was in these areas. So this, these set of photos are indicative of the drone. Um, this is the point cloud that we get from the drone. This is work with Dr. Jason Carl at the University of Idaho. Um, he's the, the drone guy. So um, hopefully I can do him justice on, on what he did here, but the point clouds, and then they can take measurements, which would be um, this, height by width measurement, or you can do what we would call kind of a drape method. So if you look at the volume that would happen underneath if you draped a sheet over the top of these willows. So those are the two measurements that they obtained from the drone and compared back to on the ground measurements of these willows, the canopy volume measurements. So the allometric was the width by um, height measurement that you saw there. What we're seeing here is that these are pretty correlated, um, about 89% or um, at pre-grazing and 79% at post-grazing when you compare the drone imagery measurements with canopy volume when you look at it from that height width dimension. Um, the 2D volume, which would be the um, volume under the sheet sort of measurement um, is even more uh, related to the field measurements, 92% and 85%. So with a little bit of fine tuning, this technology could be really helpful to land managers in the field to be able to just use that drone imagery to get a long-term look at how the willow population is doing in that area. The other thing that we have been looking at is utilization in an area where there's a lot of wildlife. So we've got moose, deer, um, and some elk 
at some times of year in this area. So this is in Lemhi County down by Ledor at the Beeler Ranch. So what we did is these animals, the cattle grazed for about two months in June and July. And prior to grazing, we took measurements of browse utilization. And you can see here that we started with um, approximately 6% browse at the point that grazing began. And that was um, something that we attributed primarily to wildlife. And this is of course from the new growth in the spring. So then when the cattle were turned out, we obviously can't distinguish from this measurement the difference between the cattle and the wildlife, but these are cumulative effects. So we started at 6% and over the time frame of grazing, we ended at 45% utilization on average of the willows. And that's cumulative, remember. And then once the cattle were removed, we measured utilization of the willows that would be attributed again just to the wildlife. So to take a closer look at that, instead of cumulative, here you see that pre-graze we had 5% utilization, 23% in total at the end of grazing. But what's interesting to note here is it does seem to matter which type of willow is um, available. So um, when we end cattle grazing, you can see there's a decrease in the amount of utilization in the lutea and the plain leaf willow, but we see an increase again in this gyre willow. So this is really interesting to us because we're seeing that these different types of willows are going to be in this time frame more or less palatable to the cattle or to the wildlife depending. And we saw this visually as well when we grazed at Rock Creek, which is a whole separate area. And this grazing occurred in July. So this is pre-grazing. We've got a sandbar willow here and a gyre willow here. And post-grazing, you can see that this sandbar willow was hit really hard by the cattle. I mean, they stripped down quite a bit, whether or not this is browse or mechanical damage, but the gyre willow was left relatively alone. And so we're seeing this in both areas where the cattle really don't prefer this gyre willow, but the wildlife do. So to us, this is a really um, exciting thing that we discovered for rest restoration efforts. Um, perhaps we plant some willows that are less palatable to cattle, but we keep having this grazing occur so that we can improve the diversity of the plants in the area through grazing. So um, we are looking at <laughs> what I would say is probably thousands of photos that we've taken in both areas. And we're gonna try to quantify some of the actual use that's happening between the different wildlife species and cattle. And we're very excited to see what comes of that. Um, and obviously I'm open to any other questions about this research. And this is kind of over a short time, a little bit of a skim over the top of what we've um, identified, but it's it's exciting and we're looking forward to being able to implement some of the things that we've learned about grazing in riparian areas to manage better, to work on rest, restoration efforts and all of these different things wrapped into one. So um, I apologize for the quick overview of everything, but I'm open to any questions that you might have at this point. Well, Melinda, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll throw it out there. We've got a few minutes. What about like what with the research you're doing, um, what do you see as like a application, say, for our area around like Lake Cascade or um, in this watershed in particular? Um, so I think the biggest thing here is when you look at livestock management in general, what, no matter where you are, I think the biggest thing is to understand that they can be a tool. Management of livestock can be a tool to, to get to a place where you wanna be. And while a lot, a lot of these things aren't documented super well, and that's kind of the effort that we're working on is to document how you can use these things as a tool. I think the, the biggest thing is to identify what do I want in the end and how do I manage to get there? So like, for example, we want to increase the 
um, diversity of these riparian pastures and and maybe we do go in and graze really heavily for a couple years to get these things promoted and get going and then we're improving the overall health of the riparian and wildlife habitat i don't know that i would recommend that on a year to year every year for the rest of time basis because we don't have good information on that yet but riparian areas are very resilient and i think that we can certainly use livestock to get where we need to be rather than exclude them. And that would Im improve, in my opinion, relationships with producers and land managers and, and get to end goals that really I'm finding are the same for everybody. It's just not the same language a lot of times, so. Excellent. Well, um, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Ellison. And uh, we appreciate you sharing your research. If you don't mind, there's about maybe six questions in the Q&A. So if you have a moment, you could log into that. I'm sure people would appreciate hearing from you. And uh, sure. yeah, keep up the good work. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. We're going to go to our next presenter. Um, this is uh, uh, Brian with Idaho Power Watershed Programs. He's the resource professional lead water quality compliance program. Uh, Brian has led water quality license compliance at Idaho Power for the past 20 years. He also represents the hydropower industry on the Southwest Idaho Basin Advisory Group and on many watershed advisory groups, groups throughout the Snake River Basin. Previously, he worked for the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality and the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Um, Brian, uh, take it away. All right. Okay, I'm having some problems. Oh, here we go. There you go. I mean, let me know if you see uh, a change in screen. We're there. I've got the North Fork Payette River Watershed Summit. Yeah, awesome. Well, first, let me say thanks for inviting Idaho Power uh, to this summit. Um, while we don't have a huge presence in the watershed, you know, we generate on water past the BOR project. Uh, we do uh, believe in watershed restoration as a appropriate way of improving water quality. Um, while we don't have a huge presence in the watershed, we do have a role in ensuring DO levels in the river downstream, maintain state standards, and we do this through direct oxygenation and bypass of water uh, or through those spill gates. So a little bit about Idaho Power um, that I always find interesting is we serve more than 580,000 customers throughout a pretty large service area of 24,000 square miles in Southern Idaho and Eastern Oregon, and as you are probably aware, the core of our generation sources are 17 low cost clean hydroelectric facilities, uh, one of which is there at Cascade. In addition to our hydro sources, we also have natural gas and, and coal plants. Something that I was aware of, but it's always interesting again, you know, to Look at the numbers. Uh, nearly 50% of Idaho Power's energy came from these clean hydro projects in 2019. The national average is just 7%. So it's easy to see why Idaho Power is proud of our energy mix. And like most people, uh, we have an initiative and we're committed to a goal of 100% clean energy by the year 2045. Because of our clean, diverse energy mix, uh, Idle Power residential customers enjoy uh, prices well below the national average. Our prices are more than 20% lower than the national average for residential, commercial, and industrial classes. And equally important to Idle Power is maintaining a reliable electrical system for our customers. And we take that very seriously uh, from providing energy for homes and businesses to maintaining an efficient transmission system. Reliable, uh, reliability is an integral part of what we do every day to meet the electrical needs of our customers and ensure power on demand. Um, I think, uh, you know, we demonstrate and I hope you appreciate that our customers do matter to us. 
no matter what your energy needs are, we strive to create a positive customer experience. And our efforts toward that have been recognized with some of the highest customer service satisfaction scores in the uh, hydro industry. In addition to all that, we're very proud of our philanthropic efforts. In 2019, Iowa Power employees logged over 3,000 hours of volunteer hours, and we gave more than $1.2 million in charitable contributions. So as most of you are aware, the, the Cascade project is owned by Bureau of Reclamation. Idaho Power owns and operates just the hydro generation part of that. Uh, through that generation, uh, our FERC license requires us mo to monitor water temperature and dissolve the oxygen during generation, March through October. And as I mentioned before, we're to maintain DO levels in the river downstream. And we do this through atmospheric aspirators or what we call blowers and through spill if the blowers can't keep up with the, with the DO deficit. As I mentioned before, we don't have a huge presence in the North Fork Payette River watershed other than generating on water past through the BOR project. However, we are very supportive of watershed restoration. Um, we know that through our 30 plus years of studying the Snake River, uh, changing inflowing water quality most likely will have the most sustainable and the greatest effort, uh, or sorry, effect in improving water quality in our reservoirs. And toward that end, we monitor water quality throughout the Snake River watershed at multiple locations. Each of those stars is a location uh, from Milner Dam down to Hell's Canyon. Most of you, I hope, have heard of the Snake River Stewardship Pro Program. It's part of relicensing the Hell's Canyon complex. Uh, it's an example of a watershed restoration effort Idaho Power is implementing, and it, it aims to address the Snake River's wide, uh, slow channels near Marcine that lead to excessive warming, sedimentation of the substrate, and unwanted uh, aquatic vegetation. Beha Island was one of the first of several projects intended to remediate some of these problems. In all, Idaho Power intends to target 20 to 25 similar in-stream projects. We're also planting native vegetation on the banks of key tributaries in Idaho and Eastern Oregon to shade the water and improve habitat. And I am getting ready to send an email to the lead of that program after listening to Melinda's presentation to, to see if we're planting any, uh, I forget what it was, guy or willow for, for wildlife. So thanks for that information. Our Snake River Stewardship Program uh, is an innovative basin-wide restoration program. Again, we believe that rest, watershed restoration uh, is a sustainable practice for improving water quality with the goal of a clearer, cooler water, better habitat, both in and near the water and a healthier Snake River for everyone. So another watershed program we're implementing is called the, River, the Riverside Operational Water Quality Improvement Program. And it's a partnership with the Riverside Irrigation District to operate the Riverside Canal for water quality benefits. District operations preferentially use, uh, the goal of it, of the program is for operations to preferentially use high phosphorus, Indian Creek and West End drained water for irrigation while canal diversions from the Boise River and canal spin, spills back to the Boise and the Snake are minimized. So the idea is to, to use the high phosphorus water um, and reduce uh, withdrawals from the Boise River. This reuse aims to reduce annual phosphorus loads by 15 to 30,000 pounds a year and meet our DO uh, load allocation is assigned in the Snake River Hells Canyon TMDL for Boyce, for Brownlee Reservoir. And when we were originally looking at ways to address that load allocation, um, one way is through an engineering fix, which would be to 
essentially lay soaker hose throughout the reservoir. Well, we found that direct oxygenation would require about two tanker trucks, two 18 wheelers of liquid oxygen each day during the months of July and August. And at the time there was not enough liquid oxygen in the Northwest to meet that, that need. So we start looking for other ways uh, besides ear, or engineering fixes. So I, I find that pretty amazing that uh, you can do, you know, as a, uh, some of you may know Chris Randolph, who used to uh, manage environmental affairs, he said it's a win-win. You know, you can do the right thing for the water quality and the right thing for the watershed. So another uh, watershed restoration program that we're undertaking is the Grandview Irrigation Upgrade Program. This also aims to reduce sediment and nutrients to the Snake River to improve dissolved oxygen in Brownlee. Um, that's that's the, the relicensing goal. Uh, some of the ancillary effects are reducing sediment in the river, which we hope preserves some of that uh, island complex that we're building under the Snake River Stewardship Program. But the Grandview Program uh, is accomplished through a, a voluntary grower incentive program to convert from gravity to pressurized irrigation. And like the Riverside program, uh, we expect to reduce annual phosphorus loads to the snake uh, by an additional 12,000 pounds each year. And another way to look at this is that's equal to more than three 10 yard dump trucks every day during the entire growing season. And we define the growing season as 183 days. So that's somewhere, I'm um, thinking somewhere over 570 10 yard dump trucks that you can think of as backing down to the Snake River and dumping their load every year. So something that is more directly relatable to the North Fork uh, Payette River watershed is cloud seeding. And we've been actively involved in cloud seeding since 2003. And there's some terms uh, that are frequently used in cloud seeding and these describe uh, different types and one is for fog suppression. We generally see this in use around airports. Hail suppression and that's to reduce crop and property damage. Uh, rainfall enhancement and snowpack enhancement and that's really where our efforts are, are focused. Uh, namely snowpack enhancement uh, throughout the North Fork Payette River watershed as well as the Snake River watershed. And in particular Idle Power does this through more graphic cloud seeding. It is accomplished with both remote generators and specially outfitted aircraft. And we focus our efforts in the Payette, as I mentioned, the Boise Wood and Upper Snake River watersheds um, and benefits at the, the build out of this program can be substantial. For example, if you look there in, in the Payette, you know, 271,000 acre feet of water a year. And while the solution to pollution is not dilution, uh, you, you have to realize that having ample water supplies does go a long way toward providing for a healthier aquatic ecosystem. So as I said, we don't have a lot of uh, opportunity in the North Fork Payette River watershed for participation in, in watershed programs. Um, as I said, we you know ensure that the river downstream meets DO standards, but we do believe watershed restoration is a viable approach and is sustainable over the long term. So we have plenty of time and um, I'm helpful in getting us back on track. <laughs> but uh, if there are any questions, Yeah, um, Brian, great presentation. There's a few questions that came up in the Q&A. Um, the first is, let's see, does Idaho Power monitor water quality on the Payette River, specifically the Cascade Dam? Yes, we do. Every, every 10 minutes, March through October during generation. We have a probe at the real, real close, right below the bridge there below the dam. Excellent. And then the next question is, um, has the intake for the power plant always been from the bottom of the reservoir in Cascade? Can it be moved to the top to suction the warmer water? Uh, those kind of things. Um, so I would say if 
if the intake was on the bottom when it was built, it's still on the bottom. I, I don't know where the intake is. Uh, so if, you know, it, it has remained at its uh, original elevation. So you're kind of asking those questions. Uh, and I think the fishing game individual, individual presenter uh, brought this up previously that, you know, those are viable options for increasing DO, but at what, you know, at, at what price? you're increasing temperature. We know temperature is uh, a concern, particularly you know, with climate change going on. Um, Idaho Power truly believes that the better solution is, you know, the, you know, I think what you guys are trying to uh, attain, watershed restoration, instead of doing, doing something to fix just one issue. Uh, you know, there's like, and I can speak more to the Hell's Canyon complex. You know, we're undergoing with the USGS and many other partners a long-term mercury study for methylation and what are the, the practices that go on with methylation. And the, the evolving science is indicating that nutrient loads into the reservoir is a pretty uh, substantial uh, um, predictor of how much methylation occurs in a year. So. Yes, you can always build an engineering fix to solve one issue, but quite often that leads to another problem. The better solution, Idle Power believes, is always watershed restoration. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for your time and uh, your presentation. There's uh, two or three more questions in the Q&A uh, that are for you. If you have a moment, if you could just log in and you can just respond to them directly, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I, and I just click on Q&A at the bottom of the screen and start answering. That's correct. You'll be able okay. to scroll down and answer live or type your answer. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, Idaho Power. Um, so let's see here. We've got a few minutes. I was going to take a break and look at um, our agenda. Let me see here. Okay. We've got um, some time moving ahead. We're going to talk about the State endowment lands. Upcoming, we've got the current watershed condition and recent monitoring results from Idaho D, uh, Department of Environmental Quality. We're talking about Lake Cascade Bloom Watch, restoration improvement strategies, and the Valley County Waterway Management Plan. Uh, and then we'll talk about zebra mussels, and then we'll talk about work groups and a final Q&A with our panelists. Um, just a note to all the panelists, what I've been doing, I usually I give a heads up, but um, everybody coming up next, I'll send you a two minute warning and um, in the chat. And that's just so um, you can decide if you want to cut into your Q&A time or not. But um, yeah, that's us. So up next, we've got conserve and protect the state endowment lands. We'll hear from Judy Anderson, director, and Deb Faraday, president of the Payette Endowment Lands Alliance. Judy Anderson is a longtime resident of West Lake Fork. She raised six kids and wants them to have a future with clean water, swimmable rivers, and accessible, healthy lakes. She worked for the Forest Service in riparian inventory and taught high school in McCall. Deb Faraday is a longtime resident of McCall with deep family roots in Long Valley and a vast appreciation for this land, the clean lakes, and rivers she grew up with. She's grateful to have raised her family in McCall and is experiencing her grandchildren growing up in what she hopes will be a sustainable rural community that doesn't lose its small town feel. Deb taught high school science and health in McCall before retiring in 2015. And with that, we'll go to our presenters. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Gary. Um, should I go ahead and just screen share our presentation at this time? Yes. Okay, let me pull that up. Okay. Hang on just a second here. All right. Are we okay. there? You're there. I think uh, click yeah. it on in presenter mode and it will. Um... Alrighty. Move my screen over. There we go. It looks great. Okay. So we'll get started. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. And it's uh, uh, really nice to be at this watershed summit. 
Um, PILA, the Pay It Endowment Land Alliance, um, we got started uh, in July of 2020, and this is our mission statement, and I'm not going to take the time to read through the mission statement, but um, the Pay It Endowment Land Alliance is a grassroots organization uh, working to conserve and protect the state of Idaho endowment lands, which are located in the McCall area and the North Fork Pay It Watershed for current and future generations, while acknowledging a fiduciary responsibility to preserve the Idaho Endowment Land Trust. So that's our mission statement. And um, we have our vision, values, and how we work. And if people would like to go on later and read through that, they're welcome to. Um, so at this point, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who we are. We're a grassroots board of 11 members um, from various backgrounds who care deeply about protecting the ecology and freshwater ecosystems of the North Fork Pitt River watershed. And we recognize the important role a healthy ecology plays in the economy of the region. Um, we're pretty active. This is just a photo of some of the members of Pella snowshoeing to Shellworth Island in February of this year. We've spent some time on the land just exploring. Um, and we came together in July 2020, um, we had a full page ad in the Star News, which over 650, 650 people signed on to opposing Trident's large scale land swap of endowment lands. We continue to meet each week and we have since July. And here's what we've done to date. Uh, in October, Pella representatives traveled to the Idaho Capitol and Pella met with individual land board members and staff to discuss Pella mission and values and to better understand the trust obligations of the endowment through the eyes of the constitutional officers. Pella has been communicating with city and county officials as well while engaging in collaborative meetings with other nonprofit groups who have very similar values in conservation and recreation regarding McCall area endowment lands. And Pella was a recent participant in three of the meetings, the focus group meetings that were sponsored by Idaho Department of Lands. Uh, a variety of stakeholders were in that focus group and they provided feedback to IDL regarding the Pay It Endowment Land strategy known as the PELS. So um, our top priorities, Pella's priorities include water quality. Water quality is paramount. And we agree with the governor's presentation at the first meeting of this water quality summit. He said water quality is his top priority. So downstream communities and agriculture rely on water quality protection upstream. Also public access is very important to us. Maintaining what little public access is left on Payette Lake to all Idahoans benefits McCall. Idahoans in general have concerns about privatization of public lands and waters. And at this point, I'm going to um, turn it over to Judy. She's going to speak a little bit more about our priorities and our views. Am I on? Yes, I think you are. Yes, you're on, Judy. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So why does Pella feel that the IDL plan and the Trident proposal could threaten the lake? But neither the IDL plan nor the Trident proposal show understanding of the water quality issues and the other issues that affect the lake. And as David Simmons pointed out in the first meeting, the first water summit meeting, um, the Payette Lake is at the bottom of hills. And most of those hills are state land property managed by IDL and would be impacted by IDL's plan and the Trident proposal, both of which lay out residential and commercial development next to and above the lake. So the hills are highly erodible granitic soil. And when roads are built, uh, when development happens, there will be disturbance and, and pollution. 
when houses and buildings are built, there will be the same thing. Same thing with landscaping, with septic systems, and with increasing possibilities of fire, not only because of climate change, but because of intrusions into the wildland urban interface with development. So that sediment, that disturbed phosphorus, that runoff will end up flowing downhill into the lake. And those tributaries that flow um, through those lands have been crucial to bring cold, cold and clear and clean water into the lake. So that's a lake that we have seen in this summit is fragile and already impacted by heavy human use increasingly by climate change. So if the lake tips and the impacts we know will go downstream, and although now the Payette River is able to clean itself, as was reported in this summit, before going into Lake Cascade, uh, that has a deep fragility that could turn if Payette is not carefully watched. It is important to know that the land board has a public trust obligation to protect Payette Lake. So Pella is here, we are here to try and convince the land board and IDL to offer alternatives to their plan and to consider not only public input, but the health of the lake. We would like to see water quality and the health of the lake be front and center in any plan. The state trust asset management plan of 2007 states, ensure that significant land holdings will be maintained in perpetuity in order to diversify the portfolio, reduce risk and protect against inflation. So the undeveloped lands bordering the lake and the North Fork meanders would be perfect candidates to be set aside as they are and will continue to appreciate and value more than any other lands and would provide inflation protection. The land board has the discretion to set aside and maintain these lands in perpetuity and creating a buffer. No. The lake would then be more protected and a healthy lake will enhance the value of all the state lands in the area and increase the possibility of revenue generation for beneficiaries. The public has made clear also that they would like to see Ponderosa Park expanded we feel that state lands being expanded to be part of Ponderosa Park um, because of Ponderosa Park's record of good stewardship would also be a move to protect the lake. And of course, conservation easements and recreational conservation leases are also opportunities as was reported in the last summit um, by Craig Utter. Public input has brought up another idea for IDL of creating a new asset management category called watersheds. So land managed for land would be managed for the specific protection of watersheds and be managed in the timber category. That is, um, the lands cannot be sold, just like the timber lands. Watersheds as another category could lead to a real win-win strategy. For instance, municipalities, citizens groups could purchase long-term easements on this land to protect their water sources. The state of Idaho may even purchase an easement to fulfill its obligation for preserving water quality and protecting the public trust of Payette Lake. There could also be other stacked leases or activities as long as they didn't interfere with the primary uh, classification of watersheds. We support the city of McCall in their comments to the land board, which put the lake and their drinking water source front and center of their concerns. They address the importance of the undeveloped lands bordering the lake acting as a living water treatment system, reducing sedimentation, pollution and runoff. And most of all, what all of us are asking IDL and the land board for is more time to form coalitions to create uh, alternatives and to be able to work with them to not only 
increase revenue for the beneficiaries, but most of all, to protect water quality in the lake. Thank you. I'll go back to Deb. Okay, and so uh, one of the other um, things that Pella would like to highlight is that we also wanna promote education about the benefits of freshwater ecosystems and the many services they provide, such as water purification. Freshwater ecosystems can maintain sufficient water quality for drinking and domestic use. Freshwater plants and ecosystems can trap, break down process and transform pollutants, toxins, and heavy metals present in water. We know that they also help in decomposition and cycling of nutrients. Uh, freshwater ecosystems also are helping with uh, carbon sequestration. So the carbon that accumulates in uh, living plant tissue and it, the decomposed vegetation in these waterlogged conditions, this locks up the carbon stores, which helps regulate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, some of the other services include flood protection. So natural freshwater systems can control the frequency and magnitude of runoff and flooding through water interception and storage. River, river channel alterations and floodplain development can reduce the ability of ecosystems to provide this buffering effect. We also have erosion prevention. So the bankside vegetation, reed beds, riparian zones, and wetlands play an important role in soil retention and the prevention of erosion and landslides. Uh, maintaining the populations and habitats of a lot of the wildlife and aquatic species. We know that natural ecosystem processes shape ecological structure, health, and function. Maintaining their ecological status and the services they provide for future generations. Also local, local climate regulation. So evaporation over fresh waters and wetlands can cool the surrounding atmosphere and increase humidity, creating microclimates. Also pollination is another service. Floodplain meadows provide habitat for pollinating insects such as bees. Fire breaks, so bodies of water can act as breaks for regulating the spread of wildfires. Um, we'd like to just put up just a, a little slide. There is um, public comment that uh, uh, the department, this is taken from the uh, Idaho Department of Lands uh, website and um, public comment was finalized as of March 1st regarding the PELS. And if you go to the idl.idaho.gov website, this is just a screenshot you can see that they have a log of all the comments received regarding the PELS. And at the land board meeting, um, which is coming up um, March 16th, um, a review of those comments is gonna be presented. And I believe people can go on and register um, for uh, a two minute period to comment on the PELS and so if you just go to idl.idaho.gov, you can find that. Um, okay, so at this point, if anybody would have any questions for Judy or I, um, we'd be happy to take some questions. Well, let's see what we've got. Um, we've got a few in the Q&A. So um, Dick Rush wants to know, do we need to change the Idaho Constitution to add water quality as a priority along with revenue? Well, I, I'd talk about that. I think that many of us would like to see a change in the Constitution. Um, so I would agree that we have been inspired by other constitutional changes in states around us where they put in uh, they put in language about the ben benefits of having a healthy environment for the citizens of the state as something that needs to be considered along with revenue. So in the long term, 
I personally would want to work for a change in the constitutional language. But for right now, it's on the table and we have to deal with what's on the table right now and at least get, get something in place that can be a protection. Excellent, thank you, Judy. Uh, the next question is uh, from David Simmons. What are some ideas for funding of municipal watershed conservation easements or leases, i.e. land and water conservation funds, et cetera? You know, um, we, we have been talking a little bit about the fact that um, there's gonna be a lot of players here and a lot of, we need some time to come up with some of those ideas. Um, getting some of the larger umbrella groups involved uh, possibly in funding some of these um, ideas for conservation easements or leases are out there. You know, with the continuation of the focus group um, and having dialogue with local stakeholders, that's where I think we might be able to, to dialogue and come up with some other ideas. And maybe Judy has something to add to that. Oh, I think that uh, municipalities would be, uh, I think there would be, municipalities would be uh, able to search the availability of all kinds of federal and state help to uh, secure their water sources. Yeah. And, but like Deb said, we would need time to develop those things. Um, I have no concrete answer for it, just hopes. Awesome. Um, the, let's see, anonymous attendee says, I can't disagree with Pella's goals, but need help. Um, how do you wanna help the land board meet its constitutional mandate for down at lands? What does Pella suggest for these lands around the lake? I'm sorry, what was the beginning of the question? It says um, they agree with your goals, but need to help, but we need to help the land board meet its constitutional mandate. What does Pella suggest for these lands around the lake? So I think. Yeah, yeah. so we, ha we have suggested the idea of conservation easements, le stacked leases, more recreation leases that are, are stacked and go along with the timber timberland classification. But what I also addressed in there is that the land board has the discretion to set aside some lands in perpetuity as um, to protect against risk and to protect against uh, inflation. So they have that elasticity. They have that ability to say, these lands should be set aside now. They are only going to appreciate in value. We'll set them aside. We need them as a buffer to actually protect, to actually fulfill our other obligation, which is, which is a public trust obligation towards the lake itself. So they have, they're wearing two hats there. We have to figure out how they're going to balance them. And usually the fiduciary obligation will win out, but there is language that, um, again, gives them flexibility to set aside lands in perpetuity. And the borderlands, for me, would be the best candidates. Excellent, thanks, Judy. Um, and then Beth Montgomery asked, uh, so talk about what is happening with water quality of Payette Lake over recent years. How is that connected to water quality issues in Lake Cascade as well? Well, hi, Bev. Bev is my second cousin. <laughs> I want to say hi to her. <laughs> Certainly. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm just going to speak from my experience as a local and, and just being on the big pit like Water Quality Council as well. Um, y you know, there's, there's been a change in the water um, from my standpoint anyway, just the way the water looks. And I know we had some real issues um, Last year, I think David Simmons might have pointed this out. There were, and, and Chase Cusack as well in his presentations about some of the, the algae blooms that, th that were not toxic, but we've got a foul odor smell that residents along the west side were reporting. 
kind of a granular type of feel to the water that's being investigated. Um, but you know, it, it's a sign that we need to be paying attention to water quality in Payette Lake. Now, how is it connected to water quality issues in Lake Cascade? Well, water does um, run into Lake Cascade. And so, you know, all of these um, issues are gonna, are gonna mesh. They're all gonna, they're all related. Warming of the climate, warming of the water temperature, dissolved oxygen, um, nutrients, um, there is a study that's being um, conducted on the lake right now, which you probably heard about, Dr. Wilhelm. Um, one of my former students, Heather Crawford's working on that. And they're studying more about phosphorus and nitrogen and what's happening uh, in our lake. So I hope that kind of helps answer some of that question. Excellent. Um, Judy and Deb, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, there might be, uh, just keep an eye on the Q&A and see if there's any more questions for you, but I'm going to go travel on to our next presenter. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, up next, we have Big Lake Payette Current Watershed Condition and Recent Monitoring Results with Chase Cusack, our Watershed Water Quality Analyst from the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Chase is a water quality analyst with the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality in Boise, Idaho, and a native to the Boise area. He has a BA in Environmental Studies from Boise State University and an MS in Environmental Science and Management from Idaho State University. He is currently our watershed lead contact and focused on water quality monitoring and management in the North Fork Payette River watershed. Uh, Chase, thanks for joining us again and take it away. All right, thank you. Can you guys hear me all right? Audio is good. Okay, uh, let's get this up. I think that was uh, last question was a great segue into this uh, presentation. Is that showing up okay? Looks great. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you all uh, for having me. Uh, this is act or part two of my act, I suppose. Um, for those of you who maybe missed that first one, I'm, I'm thankful to uh, be able to dive a little further into the Big Payette Lake uh, data that we didn't get to get into last time. So I uh, appreciate you having me back. Um, there's a lot of data to go through, so we'll go ahead and get started. So to give you a little background, for those of you who might not be familiar, uh, some of this has been talked about throughout the summit. Um, but basically what we're looking at is we're looking at this long-term uh, annual sampling that DEQ has been doing dating back to 1997. And that sampling was part of the uh, Big Pay at Lake plan, implementation plan. Um, and it was focusing on four objectives. And those objectives were the minimum dissolved oxygen, um, average dissolved oxygen, median total phosphorus or TP as I'll refer to it a lot and then a medium chlorophyll A in the lake. We'll go through a little bit more of uh, where those apply as well. Um, one thing I wanna point out, a lot of these do apply to the Southwest uh, Basin, which is labeled on this map as BPL1 or Big Payette Lake 1. Uh, so a lot of this data is, uh, is focused on that basin. And another thing I wanna point out is that this data applies to this open water, um, both shallow and deep, uh, but a lot of the information that's being collected now on the near shore uh, is very different in, in its nature. So um, the data we're gonna go through today, it it's mostly applies uh, to this open water data. So the sampling we're doing at DEQ, um, it's a full depth profile of temperature, specific conductance, pH, dissolved oxygen, uh, when I say full depth profile, I mean we're, we're sampling from a variety of different depths uh, from, the, from the lake bottom all the way to the surface using a, a multi-parameter water quality sun. Um, and so the two areas we're going to focus on today is the epilimnion or that upper layer as I'll often referred to and the hypolimnion or that lower layer. So in the epilimnion, uh, what we're sampling and we're doing composite samples uh, mostly for nutrients, so nitrogen, phosphorus, 
uh, total cell level nitrogen ammonia uh, dissolved orthophosphorus. And uh, so the, co the composite uh, portion of that is essentially um, multiple samples from within that layer that are, uh, that are composited into one single sample. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. <clears throat> Additionally, we, we do take uh, secchi depth readings, uh, which gives us an idea of the depth of visibility or light penetration, um, and chlorophyll A readings as well. And the hypolimnion or those lower layers, we're basically sampling for the same data, uh, with the exception of the chlorophyll A, um, and typically the secchi depth doesn't reach down that far. So. Okay, so let's dive into the first objective. These, as I mentioned, these objectives, there's four of them. Um, they're set out in that early plan. The first objective is dealing with dissolved oxygen. And uh, we're looking through the summer months mostly, and we're looking between zero to 61.5 meters down. So basically the surface of the lake down to 61.5 meters. And what it's asking is that the dissolved oxygen in in that area is uh, greater than or equal to six milligrams per liter uh, at all times. And again, this is in the Southwest Basin. So what we found over the last three years, uh, in 2018 and 19, objective was met. Um, however, in 2020, most recently, we did not meet that objective. And so you'll see kind of the history of that down in this table. Um, obviously those areas highlighted in red are, are years that we did not meet the objective. We had a pretty good run uh, going from 2011 to 2019. Uh, unfortunately, this year we did not meet that objective. Uh, and this is a graph just kind of showing the same thing. Uh, but you can see that blue line is the target. Uh, for the most part, we uh, since 2011, we've been above that uh, six milligrams per liter. Uh, did not see that this summer. So I'll take us into objective two. Um, this is another dissolved oxygen objective. Uh, this is the average dis dissolved oxygen through those summer months. And this is actually at, uh, between about a meter from the lake bottom to that 61.5. So originally we were, the last one we're looking at the surface to 61.5. Now we're looking at that section uh, from the bottom of the lake to that same uh, depth. And so um, what we saw here, what we're looking for here is uh, dissolved oxygen, average dissolved oxygen that's greater than or equal to three milligrams per liter. Um, and so what we saw is uh, between 2018, so over the last three years, um, we did meet that objective, which is, which is good to see. Uh, in fact, historically, since 1997, we've, we've only not met this objective uh, two different times. Uh, and both of those were, were back in uh, you know, 2000 and 1998. So, so this objective is doing pretty well. And we saw that again this year. So this is just a, a graph showing that same thing. As you can see, that red line is the objective or the target. And uh, those red bars are the average DO in that bottom layer. And so you can see that, that uh, there's a variety of different um, I guess scales that we met that objective, but for the most part, we've met that objective pretty quickly. So it takes us to objective three. This is a nutrient objective. Um, and essentially we're looking at kind of a combination of spring and summer months. And we're looking at the median TP or total phosphorus in the epilimnion, uh, which is again, that top layer. And this objective is looking for uh, a TP concentration of less than six micrograms per liter, okay? And so between 2018 and 2019, we did meet this objective at all three sites on the lake. Um, and, and for the most part, historically, this objective has been met fairly regularly um, with the exception of the dates that I've provided in there. Um, and, and then this last year uh, in 2020, we did not meet this objective. Um, one thing I do want to point out, this is not part of the objective, um, but we do actually, historically, we've seen about a 28% higher total phosphorus, median total phosphorus uh, level in the hypolimnion, so in those lower, uh, lower levels of the lake. Um, and again, this isn't part of the objective, it's kind of a side note, uh, but a lot of that probably has to do with the longer residence times of depth. Um, as well as some of the organics that are stored on the lake bed sediments. Um, but if, if we were to apply the same 
criteria to that, that lower portion of the lake, we would actually see more than twice the exceedances um, that we're seeing in the surface. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but there is a lot uh, different, there can be different circumstances going on depending on the depth. And then, so here's just showing you that blue graph is that upper portion of the lake. And you'll see that the, uh, that objective is not met at any three sites this year. And the only other time in the last five years we didn't see that was in 2017. Um, but then the bottom red graph is showing in the hypolimian or that lower zone. And you'll, really what I wanted you to see there is that we see that exceedance if we were to apply that criteria. We do see that exceedance more frequently in that lower portion. So I'm gonna go through a few graphs that are just gonna show exactly what I just talked about. Uh, this is the total phosphorus um, in the uh, epilimnion. You'll see that that blue line again is the objective. Um, I think this graph at least shows you that there's been a few instances where we've had exceedances in this objective, but for the most part throughout the lake, we've stayed fairly consistent. and We've stayed below that uh, line dating back to 1997. So that's great. Um, additionally, this is at uh, BPL1 or the Southwest Basin. So you'll see there's only a couple exceedances historically at this site uh, for that median TP. This is the north site, uh, which is actually where we see most exceedances. And this is up near North Beach. Um, and so we, this is historically where we've seen most of the exceedances in this objective. And then this is in the Southeast site, Pilgrim's Cove area. Uh, again, similar to the Southwest Basin, uh, only a couple exceedances over the history of this. Uh, this is a graph that's showing you all the exceedances uh, for this criteria in both the upper and lower, uh, upper being the solid bars, lower being the hollow bars. Um, again, it's just mostly just to give you an idea of historically what we've been looking at as far as exceedances. Um, We've seen it throughout the history of this monitoring. Uh, it hasn't been extremely consistent um, and it's ranged uh, for quite significantly in scale. But um, important thing to focus on is in 2020, we saw uh, quite a cluster of exceedances in this uh, specific objective. So final objective, uh, we're looking at those spring summer months again, and this time we're focusing on chlorophyll A. Um, chlorophyll A specifically can uh, lead to turbidity issues. It could be a kind of a proxy for nutrients in the lake. Um, and we're looking at this in uh, the epilimnion, so that, that upper portion again. Um, and what this objective is calling for is a concentration less than three micrograms per liter. And what you'll see with this, historically, this objective has been met uh, very consistently throughout monitoring. That applies to the last three years as well, uh, including 2020. And so to give you an idea, um, this graph below, uh, that, that target level is in the red line. Um, you'll see that you know there's been ups and downs um, throughout the history of this monitoring, but for the most part, we've, been, uh, we've stayed well below that target level for chlorophyll A. Um, currently, we're, you know, we're at some of those higher levels that we've seen historically. Um, but, you know, we have seen this in the past, uh, whether or not these go down next season, um, it's tough to say, so. Um, and then this, so, so this doesn't have any, uh, this isn't necessarily an objective, but it's something that uh, we've been collecting throughout the history, and there's definitely some gaps in this data, but it's interesting to look at. This is essentially, uh, so this is sec secchi depth data. Um, essentially looking at the depth of clarity in the water. And so uh, the way this graph reads is the top of the graph is, if you can imagine that as being the surface of the water, um, it's reading uh, how far down we're seeing. And these, these are average and median depths. The thing I wanna point out is, you know, early on in monitoring, we had much lower depths um, of clarity, you know, near five to six meters down. Um, We've gone through kind of a fluctuation in this, but ultimately in 2020, uh, we're sitting at about some, anywhere between six and eight um, meters, secchi depth meters. And so um, the depth visibility, though it, it's probably not as deep as some, uh, some years have shown, 
um, we're still doing pretty well compared to uh, compared to the earlier years of, of monitoring. So finally, I wanted to kind of just sum up nutrient data. Um, you know, the objective applies to total phosphorus only currently. Uh, that objective was met 11 out of the 18 years that we monitored for it. 56% um, of the exceedances in phosphorus uh, in the total phosphorus objective occurred in that North Basin site. And uh, historically though, uh, overall, we, we have met this objective fairly regularly. Um, total nitrogen being the other uh, nutrient of significance for us. There's no objective, uh, no numeric objective for this at this point. Um, but I do want to point out we have seen significant decreases in this uh, since the beginning of monitoring and uh, that's stayed pretty consistent through the years and I'll show you a graph here in a second. Um, but again, uh, much like the phosphorus, we do see higher concentrations in the lower hypolimnion um, and, and it is likely due to the, the longer residence time uh, that we see down there. So here's the graph of average total nitrogen uh, dating back to 2005. What you'll see is around 2007, there's a very significant decrease in, in the total nitrogen we were seeing. Uh, and for the most part, that's pretty much uh, evened out and has stayed fairly consistent throughout the years. Okay, so just to kind of summarize everything, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, all the objectives between 2018 and 2019 were met. Uh, we didn't really see any um, objectives not met until this year. Uh, and those were in mostly in total phosphorus and the dissolved oxygen objective, uh, one of the dissolved oxygen objectives. Um, the dissolved oxygen concentrations of the lake bottom, you know, this is something that we want to keep an eye on. Uh, it, it is only one year that we did not meet that objective. And so that's something that we will uh, look at you know, closer next year, see, see how we're doing. Um, but essentially, you know, these are dependent on these low nutrients in the lake, maintaining low nutrients in the lake. Uh, the lake has a low stimulative capacities, meaning it doesn't, it doesn't absorb its own nutrients or, or the, you know, biological processes within the lake are not um, absorbing or displacing nutrients uh, very quickly. And then additionally, you know, it's a, it's a very long stratified period for this lake. And so, uh, there's a lot of uh, limited mixing throughout the lake. And, um, you know, those are all important things when, when it comes down to dissolved oxygen. So dissolved oxygen in those lower uh, portions of the lake is something we definitely want to keep an eye on going forward. Um, we did see higher chlorophyll A levels in 2019 and 2020, but uh, again, we're well below that objective. It's something to keep an eye on, um, but I don't think it's something to be too concerned about at this point. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention, so the, the original plan, I've, I've received a lot of questions about, um, you know, what do we do with these objectives not being met? So the original plan does highlight that if, if two objectives are not met, um, you know, we, we can reassess BMPs, we can reassess management and monitoring, uh, but that's, that's actually stated uh, three consecutive years. And so over the course of this monitoring, we've, we've not had that situation come up. Um, objectives have not been met sporadically, but never three consistent years uh, of two objectives. So um, that's just something I wanted to highlight as well. And then uh, just kind of a side note, uh, this is some data on continue uh, on the Eurasian milfoil removal. If anyone has data on 2020, uh, I'd love to hear about it. I don't know specifically if there was any efforts to remove milfoil. Um, but this is pounds of, of Eurasian milfoil removed from the lake since 2014. Um, and with that, uh, I'm gonna finish up and provide a little extra uh, contact. Uh, one thing I am gonna throw in there is, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, is the Watershed Advisory Group. Uh, um, uh, DEQ has tried to, uh, uh, we've had a watershed advisory group in the past for this subject. Right. and I'm telling you, likely we'll try to organize one again uh, coming up. And so, um, if anyone has any interest in that, uh, learning more about what it is, uh, how to participate, feel free to contact me at this uh, at this email address. And yeah, I'll uh, field any questions. Excellent, Chase. Uh, oh.
Okay, let's see if that echo's gone. There we go. Um, so Chase, if you don't mind, there are quite a few questions. I think this might, you might be typing away for a little bit when we get yeah. to our next presentation, but we'll start with, um, let's see, Dean Martins is curious as to any explanation for the large drop in DO objectives one and two in 2020? Um, there's a lot that could be going into that. Uh, you know, increased nutrients is one of them. Uh, we're seeing an increase, you know, we saw an increase in total phosphorus at depth. Um, you know, that assimilative capacity that I spoke about earlier, this, you know, this lake does not have uh, the capacity to absorb or um, kind of break down those nutrients naturally uh, very quickly. There's long residence times for those nutrients. So, you know, one of the things to keep an eye on is certainly the, the amount of nutrients uh, at those depth, at those uh, lower levels. Um, anything that gets added to the lake at this point is likely to remain in the lake for, for quite a long time. And so the nutrients we're looking at now can even be uh, attributed to nutrients that were added uh, years ago. So, um, you know, that might be one thing to look at. Um, you know, one thing I didn't really present on in this is, is the water temperatures and uh, the water temperatures down in the lower portions of the lake are pretty stable. They're still very cold, um, but that, you know, the upper portions of the lake when we're seeing higher DO up there, um, that's another thing that could contribute to that. And so uh, that's another uh, thing to look into um, is, is those water temperatures. Thank you. Uh, Heather Crawford ask, do you think internal loading or external inputs play a bigger role in the increasing TP trend you've been noticing? Um, yeah, good question, Heather. Also, I want to just uh, say thanks to Heather. She's she jumped on board with me one time this year to help with monitoring, which is tough. Uh, it was tough to do monitoring during COVID. We usually have a team of about four or five people on the boat, and this year we had to limit it to two. So it was a really hard year, and, and Heather jumped in one day and helped me. So I appreciate that, Heather. Um, so in, as far as internal, external, it's difficult to say. You know, kind of what I mentioned earlier, I think some of that information collected on the near shore, um, what type of loading is coming from uh, shore erosion, things like that, um, as well as additional growth in the area around the lake. Um, I think the, the nutrients and whatnot that are within, that are in the lake already, that internal load, um, again, those are probably long-term loads. There are probably a lot of nutrients in that lake that have been there for years and years. Um, it's tough to say what the bottom of the lake looks like as far as organic material uh, and nutrient sources. So I don't know for sure. That might be something you and I can discuss more uh, a little bit later because I think there's a lot, a lot to that. Excellent. I think it's gonna, only going to get deeper for you, Chase. I'm looking at the questions here. Okay. Um, oh, the, how about this? Um, Sherry Moppin wants to know, when do you take your samples and what are their causes for not meeting goals? I'm assuming she means maybe the objectives or... What, sorry, what was that? Can you restate that? Sure, I said it a little fast. I apologize. When do you take your samples and what are the causes for not meeting the goals? Uh, when do I take the samples, uh, as in the time of day? Well, so usually, I mean, we, we sample once a month, uh, usually starting in May and try to go through October if, if uh, the weather allows. I usually sampling around, uh, you know, 11 o'clock, anywhere from 11 to 3 o'clock. So, um, you know, there's definitely certain things going on, you know, depending on the time of day that could that could contribute to this. And it's difficult to say that, you know, these numbers apply to the lake at all times because of when we are sampling. So there's limitations in that. Um, but I don't know, that, that might be one I, I need to type into just to put a little more thought into it with this, this limited amount of time. <laughs> sure. And then um, let's do this one. Uh, David wants to know if there's similar monitoring underway or currently available for Lake Cascade. I believe you presented on that earlier. Yeah, so so Lake Cascade does not have a history of this type of monitoring, mostly due to the fact that Payette Lake, you know, legislatively has um, has a plan in there for us to do the monitoring. 
Um, uh, I think it was in 2019, I did, uh, we made an effort to do a similar type of monitoring for uh, Lake Cascade. Um, I think that's something that we'll try to continue, uh, you know, into the future. And uh, hopefully, you know, it's a lot of work, but hopefully uh, we can at least get uh, data collected on both of these lakes, um, you know, every, even if we have to rotate every couple of years or so. Um, but, but currently there's not as rich of a historical uh, monitoring record on Lake Cascade. Um, that's something that probably will try to, to change a little bit. Excellent. And then, um, yeah, let's see, we've got one last question for Chase. This is from Nathan Stewart. Have the years where target exceedance occurred, do the years where target exceedances occur coincide with higher snowpack and or precipitation? I'm wondering if the flushing of the lake with higher river flows may have coincided with lower nutrient DO concentrations. Um, yeah, that's a good point. That's something I haven't, uh, I have not looked at yet. Um, and I could very well do that and get back to you on it. Uh, one thing I would say is, is the, the expanse of the lake is so great. And, you know, the output uh, into the North Fork Payette, um, you know, some of that nutrients and DO uh, that, that's occurring, you know, the data we're seeing in, let's say, that North uh, Basin, um, that's pretty significantly different than what we're seeing in that Southwest Basin where that output is. So, again, those long residence times make it difficult. Um, the depth in that North Basin makes it more difficult to determine. Um, I think the water coming out of the lake into the North Fork Payette River, um, the tricky part is it's, it's probably quite a bit different and, uh, and maybe even older than, than the water that's, that's located up in some of those uh, further basins. So um, I can look more into that as far as the, the correlation between snowpack and, and water years, but I don't have an answer uh, right off the bat for that one. Excellent. Well, Chase, thank you for your time. And um, we're going to move on to our next presenter. There's probably five or six questions for you in the Q&A, if you don't mind. Yeah. Into those will be much appreciated. And again, uh, we want to highlight that if you're interested in the Watershed Advisory Group, uh, you can contact Chase at chase.cusack at deq.idaho.gov. And we'll have some more information on that at the end of the at the end of today. All right, so we're going to move on to our next presenter. Um, this is Leonard Long, citizen scientist. Uh, Leonard is part of Lake Cascade Bloom Watch and Restoration Improvement Strategies. This is going to be his presentation today. Leonard is a retired professional civil and geotechnical engineer, certified professional in erosion and sediment control and was a licensed hazardous material contractor for his professional career. He and other citizen scientists of Friends of Lake Cascade have also received training from both University of Idaho Extension Master Water Stewards Program and the NOAA Plankton Monitoring Network. He's an avid Lake Cascade boater, swimmer, and fisherman. Uh, Leonard, uh, please take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, and, and thanks for all the people who are attending. I'm going to do a screen share here and uh, see if we can get that to come up. Do you see a picture of the lake there, Gary? We do. It looks great. Okay. Whoops. Let me go back. So this is a lake that we love. This is Lake Cascade that attracts people from all over the country for fishing and recreation, things of that nature. And this is a lake with a problem. This is, uh, the problem is actually cyanobacteria. And it's called various things like toxic algae, harmful algae bloom or HABs, or blue-green algae. The, uh, the cyanobacteria thrive on sunlight, nutrients, primarily phosphorus, uh, warm temperature, stagnant water flow, and uh, higher pH. Our lake is, is a little bit unique. It's not textbook uh, lake in that we have an old river channel that 
runs down the middle of it. We have shelves and we have uh, shallow flats. One of the things that happens during the summertime is we actually have um, an oxygen depletion with depth. You can see the little chart over here on the left where the oxygen goes to zero at the bottom of the, the lake and the temperature, we actually have a thermocline that develops between tw uh, 20 and 30 feet where the temperature in the summer will be 72 or so on the surface and down in the 50s with depth. We, uh, we have the plankton and habs that grow uh, primarily up in the upper surface where they get sunlight. But we do have wind every afternoon up here in the summer that creates mixing. So the upper layer, the epilinium, actually gets pretty good mixing and oxygen. And then every once in a while, we have winds that get up to 30 or 40 miles per hour. And these winds can actually cause mixing of the entire lake all the way to the full depth. And the reason we know that is because the temperature and the oxygen actually become straight lines for about a week before they reestablish themselves. The other thing that happens is we've had smoke off and on uh, during the summer that interferes with the uh, uh, photosynthesis of the plankton. And it may be uh, one of the causes why this year's bloom was about 10 days later than uh, last year's. The uh, cyanobacteria, you can't always tell if it's toxic. I have to call Chase. We actually have to get analytical testing to see if it's toxic. And sometimes it'll really surprise you. The water use that we have for Lake Cascade has a lot of different uses, irrigation, power, flood control, it's a drinking water supply and, and recreational use. We uh, citizen scientists uh, do sampling during the May through October time period about every two weeks at these locations that have stars. It's more of a, a observation and early warning kind of a sampling. We always wanna rely on the professionals for professional advice before uh, citizen scientists advice. The type of measurements that we do are not as sophisticated as what Chase does with his instruments. We do basically physical indicators. We, we look at dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity, pH, Secchi depth, which Chase described. Here's actually our Secchi uh, disc over here. And we, uh, we also grab samples for uh, analysis with a microscope. These uh, data that we have, we actually plug into the plankton monitoring network for NOAA. And then we also save the data on the State University of Colorado uh, SITSI website. This is just an example of the type of data that we look at here's Secchi depth uh, for this year. And what we're looking at is trends. And you can see that in July, we actually had very clear water up to 20 feet. And in the peak of the bloom, it went down to zero. One of the things that we do with these trends is look at when we can try to predict a, broom, a bloom. It's really impossible right now. But we know it, when the water temperature hits a certain uh, threshold and the Secchi depth is six feet or less and the pH is above eight um, and, and there's an oxygen indicator we know we're about ready to have a, a real good surface bloom. The anatomy of our blooms look like this. Starts off with green water. Uh, usually in July and August, we, it uh, forms globs and then streaks and then mats. And then it gets larger in area, the size of a, a football field and an acre. And pretty soon it'll become miles long. Uh, sorry about that. What the cyanobacteria look like under the microscope, you can see here. Down on the bottom, we actually have the months that different cyanobacteria rise and fall. 
uh, the, the scale on the bottom shows when they come and go. And then the thickness is kind of the, the density. And this is just based on observations, not enumerations. But you can see we actually have two cyanobacteria that are with us under the ice. We have orangina and microcystis have been uh, with us pretty much year round. And then we have uh, Gloitrechia uh, that starts up in June, peaks kind of in uh, July and August time period, and then dies out real quickly. And then we have Dolichosporum, a couple of different kinds of Dolichosporum. And then usually when Chase does the toxic testing, it's usually loaded with Dolichosporum, although at that time, it has a lot of other uh, cyanobacteria genera in it as well. But as the temperature of the water cools, it, the dominant algae becomes amphamazonin, and then we go back under the ice cap. This is what it looks like under the ice cap. These photos are just a few months ago, actually February. And you can see all of that biomass dies and settles to the bottom. Right now, these floaties, they're a combination of good green algae, diatoms, and, and some uh, orangina. We also monitor satellites. We get calls from people all the time uh, wanting to know what the lake looks like uh, for their camping adventures. So we, as Brian Reese pointed out, we use also uh, Sentinel satellites. And what we also use are uh, the EPA uh, uh, it's an app that you can get on your phone. And the EPA uh, cyan actually picks up cyanobacteria using chlorophyll and the psychocyan, uh, cy psychocyanin, which is the blue pigment. And you can see over here in these jar samples what the blue pigment looks like. It's a cyan color, that's why cyanobacteria gets its name. But we can follow the coloring, of, which is a mass density of the, uh, of the cyanobacteria, where red is in really millions of cells per milliliter, and then uh, gray is the detection limit. So you can see where we're actually having peaks. And another way of using the cyan app is that it actually has a graphing feature where on the y-axis, it has the density of the, an, an estimate of the density of the cyanobacteria in cells per milliliter. And on the bottom, it actually has the uh, dates. So you, we can see that in 18, 19, and 2000, where we actually had the uh, uh, advisories, the health advisories. Cyanobacteria affect us all. Chase pointed some of this out earlier where the toxins are a health issue. Of course, people are worried about their, their dogs and fish and, and cattle. Um, it also creates a stigma and untold tourist loss. It's more than just loss of tourism. The actual ramifications go deep into our community where we actually have fewer construction projects not only the loss of accommodations during this time period and, and rain supplies, but we have lower real estate values here and also a lower output of service. And our county uh, loses tax money with these losses. Back in 93 and 94, there was a cattle kill and uh, 23 cattle died. But this, I don't expect you to be able to see all of these reports, but Prior to 93 and 94, DEQ and, some, and Health Department did a number of investigations where they were looking at uh, the changes that were occurring starting in the 70s. This, this reservoir was constructed in 1948, by the way, so it's 73 years old. But these changes were starting to occur and these reports were outlining potential problem. And after 93, then the problem became more, uh, more open, and there were a lot more investigative reports that were going on. 
And the reports turned out to show that phosphorus is a, the problem. And IDQ has a target level of phosphorus that we need to meet. And basically, uh, as Chase pointed out in his presentation, we don't meet it. And uh, so that's one of our targets. And this is from the DEQ implementation plan, all these various percentages of sources of phosphorus. And this is outdated. And these, these actual percentages, I'm sure, are different today than what they were. But the point of this is that it's not one industry that's a problem. It's all of us that have to be working on phosphorus. And it has to do with everything from septic systems to urban runoff, uh, which Pella is kind of concerned about, not kind of concerned, they're very concerned, uh, up in the uh, Payette Lake uh, to uh, forestry roads and grazing and, and things of that nature. So it's not one industry. The uh, cleaning up the lake, people say, well, why don't you just clean it up? And it, it, if you actually treat the cod, uh, treat the, the, the lake itself, it's millions of dollars. There's companies out there that are coming up with solutions but uh, right now they're not feasible for an entire lake. And, uh, but there's something that we need to stay on top of because we might be able to do some pilot programs and let's say clean up a tributary arm like Boulder Creek or, or clean up an area, a backwater area like Sugarloaf State Park or maybe the south end of the lake or maybe Tamarack will be looking at some of these for uh, providing a clean marina. So we need to look at some of these and, and see what work with our cyanobacteria and what don't work with our type of cyanobacteria. So they might be uh, usable in the future. One of the presenters a few weeks ago said conservation is less expensive than restoration. I think we, this was echoed today by Idaho Power and it's echoed here as well. And, and uh, doing the con uh, conservation measures are really looking at our stormwater runoff or septic systems or excess fertilizer, animal waste, dust on, from unpaved roads, erosion, legacy treatment, legacy sediments, uh, things of that nature. The, the, the uh, non-point source cleanup right now is basically a voluntary program. So, we need to get education and incentives, more incentives out to people to actually volunteer and, and do some of these best management practices. We have some that are out of our control, like shoreline erosion from wind damage. Um, we have four to six foot waves out there to create uh, vertical cliffs up to 50 feet. There are some boating waves that, that create some problems that we can handle as well. One of the issues we have is a lot of septic systems in the uh, lake area, especially the south end of the lake, where we have a uh, high water table. Uh, the health department did a study about 20 years ago, showed 70% of the privies were substandard at that time. And uh, right now, nobody really knows what that percentage is. Uh, it, but we do know that poorly maintained septic systems uh, do not remove nitrogen and phosphorus. So we need to rally around the South Lake Sewer District and help them uh, put together some programs, some septic smart education programs. We need to uh, look at trying to get people to do three to five year pump out intervals, replacing some of the vault pit toilets with pumpable vaults and, uh, and that sort of thing. One of the uh, issues that I talk to ranchers around here, they tell me that their beef export phosphorus. And it's true. Uh, phosphorus uptake in cattle through the bone tissue and the meat, the same with crops that leave the valley. But there's also a, a, an amount that shows up in runoff and excess fertilizer. So the, the way the theory works is that best management practices are critical. 
So we actually have to have best management practices to allow that theory or to make the theory work. So um, we need to provide incentives so that people will follow um, these kind of best management practices. And there's plenty other best management practices out there. I see where I'm running out of time. I do have a wish list uh, that will be posted of things that I would, uh, that our group would like to see uh, implemented. And one of them is funding for DEQ to do more in-depth uh, sampling of our lake. I need to thank people along the way for friends. Um, we've had a lot of help from a lot of different individuals and uh, Lake Cascade, it's a beautiful lake. Is it worth saving for public use and drinking water? I think so. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. And at this point, I'll take questions. And if I've made any mistakes, I have Chase online here. He can he can chime in and, and correct anything that I've said. Excellent. Thank you, Leonard. Um, looking at, let's see, the Q&A here. Um, how about, uh, let's see, Dean Martins is curious about the autumn bloom issue. Could that be reduced if Lake Cascade had a larger conservation pool and was not drawn down drastically each year? Re-exposing raw soil banks and eroding material annually, these are not uncommon issues for shallow reservoirs of this age, especially if they are drawn down annually. Probably. I think it's something that needs to be looked at and talked about. If we're wasting water, I'm, I'm not saying take away from irrigation, but I'm saying if we're wasting water and we can keep the pool higher and we can keep uh, the water temperature colder, certainly it has to do, uh, it has to help. Excellent. Well, uh, Leonard, we're out of time. So uh, there's a few questions for you in the Q&A. Uh, one is, um, somebody wants to know how to get a copy of your presentation. Is that something they could get through the, go ahead. The presentation was basically cut in half. The whole thing, uh, because of time constraints, it's more of a 45 minute presentation, but I will put the whole thing on the uh, Valley Soil uh, Water Conservation District website, yes. Excellent. And uh, yes, please take a glance at the Q&A and uh, you can, there's some work to do there. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go on to our next presenter. Uh, this is uh, Christina Kacher. Uh, Christina is an environmental and recreation planner with Logan Simpson out of Fort Collins, Colorado. The Logan Simpson team completes recreation, open space, river and resource management and community comprehensive plans uh, for communities and land management agencies across the Rocky Mountain West. They recently completed multiple planning efforts for McCall and the West Central Valley Economic Development Strategy. Uh, Christina will be helping to lead the Valley County Waterways Management Plan. Uh, Christina, thank you for joining us today and uh, take it away. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, audio is good. Awesome. Thanks for uh, taking the time to squeeze me into the schedule here uh, on their last day of the summit. I've been uh, listening into all the great information here. Um, I'm just gonna share. A quick presentation with you. Uh, I'll preface this by saying this is a really big trailer. There's going to be lots of cliffhangers at the end of this. Um, so again, yeah, my name is Christina Keacher, and thanks everyone for um, joining us today. We are, um, the Logan Simpson team has just been contracted with the, with Valley County um, to complete a waterways management plan. And um, the team here, uh, Bruce Meehan and myself, primarily from Logan Simpson, have been working um, in the McCall area for quite a while now. And we are looking forward to developing this plan. And we literally just kicked it off last week. Um, so I don't have too many answers for you today. Um, but we wanted to make everyone sort of aware of this project and um, we'll be reaching out to many of you as key stakeholders to develop um, some of our public involvement plan, which I'll get to in a second. Um, again, this planning effort is through Valley County, primarily through um, CINDA, the planning 
um, department there, and she will be the project manager um, as the primary client, as well as uh, Michelle with the city of McCall. Um, and then our team, we also have a PE, Jennifer Zong with Harmony Design, and Diane Cushlin, who, um, who lives there part-time in McCall and um, has been working with the city to do some of their land use planning. And so that's kind of where this waterways plan um, will intersect uh, community planning, recreation planning, resource management planning to really um, highlight the vision and environmental setting for these uh, various waterways. And so we're defining waterways um, as both, we're calling them waterways because there's lakes and reservoirs and rivers um, that the scope of this plan will look at. Um, so you can see a sample of the lakes and reservoirs that we will be um, looking at uh, as far as the countywide plan goes. There are some um, obviously larger lakes and then some smaller lakes. So we, we're gonna start thinking about how do we divide these up into either their character or their allowed uses and also their, um, obviously many different agencies are involved in each reservoir or lake property. So um, that will go into our, our project management plan as we start to develop here. Um, the, some of the pre, pre, primary goals are to, you know, look at how the environmental setting um, and allowed uses merges with recreational trends to develop a desired character. Um, and so we'll have a countywide vision um, and then drill down into each of the specific goals for each waterway. Um, more specifically, some here's some general topics that we, we want to hit for goals and outcomes of the plan. Um, these will be refined as we meet with our steering committee, as we, as we start this project, we're going to come up with, um, you know, really, uh, refine these some more. So don't, you know, write these down or take a screenshot of it, but I've been doing that with your presentation. So it's been very helpful. Um, so generally we want to look at, you know, what opportunities are there for vis various user types? Um, and looking at adaptable, uh, an adaptable management structure. So um, this plan might not be, not all the best management practices might not be implemented tomorrow, but will there be, what are the key indicators we wanna look at? Some of those water quality indicators, recreation indicators, um, so that if we hit a certain point, um, we, change, we change the management. So um, we'll be looking at carrying capacity for each of the waterways um, and to provide basic um, guidelines and code recommendations, both on water and um, adjacent land uses. So we'll be um, looking at, at some of those recommendations as well as far as like setbacks and water quality and um, development standards um, that, that impact water quality, both on water and off water. Um, we, we don't have, we won't have <laughs> all of the, you know, science and, you know, there's so much that goes into this. And so we might be having to provide some, um, some recommendations for future research or how can we incorporate what has already been um, done as far as the data goes. Um, but generally we want to, you know, look at what are the best practices across Idaho, as well as, um, you know, what, what benefits and impacts um, of those various choices are. So um, quickly here, we'll be putting together a steering committee, which is going to be made up of um, primarily elected. So from the county and from McCall, but also Donnelly Cascade um, and advisory group representatives. And then the technical advisory committee is where we're gonna be reaching out to uh, many of the people who have spoken through this summit. Um, land and resource managers from um, the various state departments to the um, environmental quality to uh, the waterways groups to sort of everyone that involves in, in that. And we kind of see the next level of stakeholders. I mean, it can involve a lot of different people from recreation interests to land and homeowner interests to those natural resources interests. And then um, dividing up 
Um, you know, we, we know that there's going to be, there's more developed reservoirs, more urban reservoirs that will have certain issues and then other lakes and reservoirs that will be more like the Alpine lakes. Um, so we'll be able to divide those up to make sure we're having conversations across all the different types of um, issues and opportunities that we'll be developing. So um, we will be putting our public and outreach engagement planning efforts up on a website. Um, we don't have a website URL yet, but it will be through the Valley County's website so we can get that information out. Um, we'll have a landing page for all the public information uh, um, out there and ways for people to interact throughout the process. Um, and the process will be about an 18 month process. I think the press release that's going around says two years, 24 months, but we're hoping to be done by September of 2022, which gives us sort of two summer seasons to, to reach out to um, the general public, but also work throughout the year to get input as well. Um, like I said, yeah, we're just starting. We just kicked off it, kicked off the process last week um, with Cinda and her team. And um, we'll be developing um, surveys in the sort of the middle of the process to look at um, carrying capacity, vision and goals for each of the specific waterways um, and get people's perceptions on, you know, how do you feel about different um, features, different um, implementation actions, different, um, or how you just feel as a recreationalist or as a resource um, owner or as a landowner, I mean, or a resource, a natural resource, um, you know, concern. And, and of course those all overlap, right? You, you, we're not gonna put people into specific buckets like that, but um, those are sort of the main um, overall topics that we're gonna be looking at. And then um, the third task is really looking at that adaptive management plan. So looking at different management opportunities, different code regulations or other types of regulations that we would want to investigate further to create sensible planning guidelines um, to developing uh, this concept plan. And so the key, the key product that will come out of this is, is a report, is a planning effort. Um, that will be looking at various implementation actions. And we're still working through an outline of what that could look like. So we'll be asking the public, you know, what, what would be most helpful to see in this plan. So if you guys have any ideas, please, you know, you can put those in the Q&A or just you can email me later as well. So um, the specific outline of the plan, again, is like still being developed. Like, so again, cliffhanger, but <laughs> this is where we're headed. Um, you can give myself a call or an email, um, as well as Cinda is the project manager for Valley County, um, who's the who's the contractor for the, or who is the client and uh, for this project. So feel free to reach out to any of us and stay tuned for more information. Uh, we'll be getting out um, um, that as we go through, you know, shortly in the next like month or two, hopefully to have a more dialed down steering committee group and asking people to be part of that. Um, so look out for that information. Excellent. Christina, thanks for uh, joining us today and uh, bringing your work to our attention. It sounds like uh, big things are coming down the pipe. Stay tuned. Awesome. There are a few um, questions for you in the Q&A, or at least one, if you can take a glance at that, and then we're going to carry mm -hmm. on with our next presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, okay, our next presenter is uh, Bethany Muffley, an Ag Program Specialist with the Idaho State Department of Agriculture with a focus on invasive species. Bethany is a Southwest Idaho Region Specialist, not only in invasive species, but also with the Noxus Weed Program. Uh, she executes sampling and treatment activities to, and provides assistance and support to Southwest Idaho counties in relation to noxious weed and invasive species issues. She may also be joined by some others today. We'll find out. Um, but uh, Bethany, I'm going to go straight to you and you can get us started. Okay. Thank you. And we will be joined by others because just like in true invasive fashion, you ask for one and you're going to get three. So my, my boss on the noxious weed side, Jeremy Varley, and my other boss on the invasive species side, Nick Zerflu, are also here. And I'm probably going to divert to them for a lot of these questions that could come in. 
especially in regards to the zebra and quagga mussel. Um, we didn't per se have uh, an official presentation and we were just kind of asked to open up a dialogue for questions on invasive species concerns. I guess to generate some of those questions, I could just say that uh, the Payette watershed is on our radar and we do visit those water bodies uh, multiple times each season. We're doing a combination of invasive species um, early detection survey work. So that would be the early detection of adult mussels or taking um, Bellinger samples, which is using a, a uh, plankton tow net where we send the samples off for analysis to make sure that we don't have an infestation of zebra or quagga mussels. We do send roving crews to both um, Payette Lake and Cascade Lake, and they offer on-site education for boaters that are launching. Um, and I'd like to say I'm really happy to be a part of this of this webinar because all the information that we're getting, these are things that we can uh, shuffle to our roving crew members so that they can also provide education on these sort of issues as well. Um, with noxious weeds, the whole time we're out there surveying, we're also doing uh, noxious weed surveys. So that could be shoreline, that could be from a kayak, that could be from a boat. Um, and we do uh, help provide support when needed for payette milfoil removal treatments that are all non-chemically based with the with a suction removal system and surveys on Cascade Lake. We've honestly not, we have found suspect Eurasian water milfoil, but it's never been in a high enough concentration um, that has really alerted people to its presence. And when we found it in one place, we would go back for a survey and it wouldn't be there. And the thought is that could potentially be um, attributed to the drawdown, but potentially the drawdown is also helping keep those populations down. So, do we have any questions yet? <laughs> or do I, do I have a Jeremy or Nick? Do you guys want to chime in? I think he, yeah, I think I'll keep going. Uh, let's see. Uh, just make some outlandish statements. Terrify us a little bit. And I usually get the Q&A going pretty good. <laughs> hey, Nick, you want me to start? <laughs> um, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the excitement of uh, the zebra and quagga mussel detections in the state. And there's Mr. Nick. You want to take this one on? Wow, he's got his own built-in mask, everyone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Bethany. Um, and thank you to the group for letting us have a little bit of a time to, to share some of our story. This is great. Um, so just this last week, we had a detection of zebra mussels in the state of Washington. It was at a pet store in Seattle, Washington. And the detection was that the zebra mussel was found in a contamination along with some moss balls for sale. And these moss balls are a common uh, aquarium. Yeah, um, on the back of Bethany's pictures there, they're a very common aquarium uh, plant trade. You know, you see them all the time. Uh, well, we typically don't see them with zebra mussels. Uh, especially zebra mussels in the Pacific Northwest and the Columbia River Basin. So this really caught some people's attention. Um, our team was dispatched to multiple step pet stores throughout the state uh, doing follow-up inspection. And we in turn found zebra mussels and stores in Idaho. Uh, we also were a state that performed viability tests for anything that we find. Uh, and within those viability tests, we found both dead and live viable zebra mussels on this uh, contaminated uh, product coming out of Petco and PetSmart. Uh, this quickly became a national wide issue uh, from Alaska to Florida, up to Vermont, Maine, down to California. And California in particular, because that is where the source distributor was coming out of. This was coming in through a port in Los Angeles, California. Um, through that time, we were able to ratchet down the distributor um, so no more product is going out. Uh, we've been able to quarantine those sites to the state of California and USDA APHIS PPQ, as well as US Fish and Wildlife Service. There was, this was really a collaborative effort across the board. Um, at that same time, we dispatched some additional resources here in Idaho. We were able to get around to all the pet stores um, as far as Petco and PetSmart, uh, which are the two store chains that have been identified that work through this distributor. 
uh, and we've been able to remove all the product off the shelf. Um, that initially was done within 24 hours. So for a response of this magnitude and, and that quick, that's it's very, it's very good to see. Uh, the same thing is occurring all over the, nas the national scale. Um, and now we're in the process of making a return visits, picking up any product that was in transit uh, that may be destined to the stores in Idaho. So we're keeping a close eye on that. And then we're also looking into uh, any other distributors um, or stores that may be involved. There's also some questions around the online pet trade and what moss balls um, may be involved as well in that regard. Uh, I will say that we're a state that likes to likes to verify um, occurrences. And so we're gonna go through and investigate each and every one of those to the point of, of absence or presence and then go from there. So um, anyways, uh, Bethany, is that is that a good intro? <laughs> I think so. Did we scare everyone enough? <laughs> or did we put your hearts at ease because we are jumping on the situation as fast as, as we found out? So. Yeah, and that's, See, that's a good point. You know, we had a press release go out that has some um, basic methods on how to dispose of, of anything of concern out there right now that the public may have, any aquarium owners and so we have a press release and we're very active on Facebook and social medias. And so feel free to share any of that information and get the word out. We appreciate that. And, um, and that's, yeah, to write, or I guess to say our invasive species website is called invasivespecies.idaho.gov. Um, there is an entire page that's dedicated to this detection. And then also all of our contact information is on that page too. And if you want to know updates as we get them, uh, friend us on Facebook, be our friend. And that's where we're able to get like the quick responses out to, I mean, to just kind of show people what's going on and what we're seeing. And then I guess, Jeremy, would you <laughs> like to add some noxious weed stuff? <laughs> oh, your sound isn't on yet. Here we go. <clears throat> so um, for noxious weeds, uh, thank you for letting us have it. Yes, we have a very active program um, in this, this watershed um, as far as anything from helping out uh, with the Valley County um, irrigation water milfoil removals in that we they do uh, petition us for funding for those um, control efforts um, through their cooperative weed management areas. Uh, they usually put in an annual request to help fund some of that work that goes on um, and as well. I mean, so we're also very active in our, our survey aspect of looking for Eurasian water milfoil primarily um, in that area, as well as other uh, noxious weeds that can be found at that invasive species uh, website that uh, Bethany just mentioned. Um, it is something that we're always trying to keep an eye out for uh, because we do realize that, you know, just like the, the uh, moss balls, uh, we can always have a um, potential release into our, our water bodies that uh, we then find that new invader as it moves in. We try to catch it at early stage. So we always encourage uh, people to keep an eye out for something that just doesn't look right in your water body. If you notice a plant that's growing, um, that doesn't seem like it's the right fit for there. Uh, we're always ready to, and ready to respond. Bethany is, is the region specialist for your area specifically. And so she is the valuable asset that you'll most likely see on site there um, to assess that, uh, that plant, take a look at it. Because if we can catch it early, we can usually do some form of control um, on that early to keep it and get it eradicated sooner. Um, you know, and we, we have a whole toolbox that we utilize um, with those different situations. And we, we always try to make sure that that's tailored to um, each individual water body's needs. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's always a lot going on with plants uh, and uh, we're always happy to help out where we can. And that includes both the aquatic environments as well as those terrestrial noxious weeds as well. Uh, you know, we, we do know that Valley County does have a, a weed superintendent there. He's a very knowledgeable resource that you guys can go to, uh, Steve Anderson. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we do have the state re resources as well. So, uh, but if there's any questions regarding noxious weeds, I'd be more than happy to answer those um, for ISDA uh, for you guys. But uh, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and I could maybe, I don't know how much time do we have, Gary? We've got... 
Are we out of time? <laughs> yeah, we're kind of out of time. Okay. We're a little I was just over. Say, we do have outreach messages. If you guys see knock it off, clean, drain, dry, know what you grow and don't let it lose. Those are all campaign efforts for noxious weed and invasive species that we can help you incorporate that into your message if you're interested. Excellent. And uh, there are a few questions in the Q&A. I see Nick's already on it. And um, yeah, if you could just follow up with that and please don't go, we're going to have more of an open forum Q&A. And so there might be some questions that come back to you from everyone else. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, what's next. And so we've had uh, four um, watershed summits so far on this Zoom platform, these webinars. And again, those have all been recorded and um, are being posted on our website, which I'm gonna share with everyone right now. Let's see here, put this in the chat. Let's see here, where'd it go? Okay. There we go. And so um, what's next? So what I wanna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, where we go from here. I can find my presentation. All right, just a minute. Let's do this. Okay, everybody, bear with me. Long pause. Here we go. Okay, where do we go from here? So um, it's again, we've highlighted the different uh, working groups that we wanna get set up. We've talked about the watershed advisory group. And in general, um, what we need to do is we need to take all these different components that we've explored with the watershed summit and bring them together. This through a process of collaboration where we can begin to take this information and start to prioritize solutions and make some choices that are gonna help us protect and improve our water quality in the watershed. Um, some identified work groups include uh, land issues such as land management, or I should say topics such as land management, erosion waves, wastewater sewer, water storage, wetlands, aquatic vegetation, fish, and then a technical advisory committee. And all these could be used to inform the watershed advisory group. Um, each work group will function along these lines. Well, there'll be kind of a, a core group where people can sign up for leadership roles, uh, building a team that'll work together, and then through like making choices, through prioritization, reaching out and learning from the public and identifying funding sources, they can then hopefully take some solutions to the watershed advisory group. Um, if you wanna participate, you can contact Darina Farr. Um, or you can use the link posted here. And there's also a link in the chat and that'll take you to the Watershed Summit page. Again, on that page, we've got all the past, you can find links to all the past recordings or all the recordings of past summits. Um, you can find out uh, there's a survey form if you do wanna participate in a watershed advisory um, or a watershed working group. And then there's an application process through DEQ if you wanna participate in the watershed advisory group. Excellent. Um, so now we're going to go to a broader q and I'm going to pull up the Q&A box. If I could have our panelists come back and join. And we're going to start um, seeing what people want to know. Um, Gary, Leonard, do you have something to add? I do. I, I just wanted to say that during this summit, and and the information that was presented just recently, we've identified a number of, of work groups, but if something is missing and somebody uh, wanted to hear or get something else out of this watershed summit, that's one thing we need to know right away. So it would be great if, if you see something missing, let us know. The other is, I'm extreme, personally, I'm extremely happy that the county is working on this uh, waterways management plan. And I wanna make sure that uh, Simpson Logan uh, gets all the help that they need. And we're not, uh, we don't wanna 
step on each other's toes, what we want to do is complement their program as a, as a planning group. So any way we can help Simpson and Logan, um, I think we need to do that as well. Excellent. And there's a, um, a question in the Q&A, Leonard, you might be able to take it, but um, Nathan Stewart wants to know what are the different roles and responsibilities for the groups and should we contact DEQ? Yeah, th the groups aren't really established at this point and the roles are, are not established. We don't have the leaders selected. Um, it's something that we're trying to find who's interested in which type of work group by responding to Dorena, their Valley uh, Water and Soil Conservation District. So these are work groups that will form and take place over probably the next six month time period. One of the hopes is that after the work groups come up with some recommendations, things of that nature, that we all come back together next fall and present to the people um, what's been developed by the work groups. Excellent, thank you, Leonard. Um, let's see, any other questions? Okay, there's a couple from earlier, mainly talking about the land use around the watershed, but um, this might be a Pella-oriented question. Have there been any attempts to calculate the recreational base revenue on state lands, et cetera. And adding to that, how much revenue does recreation bring into Valley County? Uh, this is Judy. Uh, I'll answer the first part of that question. Uh, I don't know, but I know that, um, of course, we can look at what IDL gets from its recreation leases, because they certainly keep records of that. But there's no way to uh, calculate the many people who use the state lands and don't come underneath any of that recreation lease um, category. They just go there because they go there to pick berries or they go there to pick mushrooms or they go there to picnic or, or cross country ski. So there has been no way to calculate that. However, people in the focus group have again and again asked IDL to please come up with some more sophisticated methods of handling your recreation leases, offering your recre recreation leases, and calculating the effect of them. Because uh, basically, they don't seem to have a sophisticated system like they do for timberlands, for, you know, which is a very sophisticated system of how to calculate how timberlands are used and who can use them and how they can offer the timber sales and everything. They don't really have that system in place uh, at the same level of sophistication for recreation leases or, or an, and especially they don't have any system really in place for conservation easements. So we don't know those answers. And as for the Valley County statistics on what recreation brings to the Valley, I don't know those, but my guess is the Chamber of Commerce would know them or the county. So that's the best I can do, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, let's see, next question. Um, how can we work with the waterways management group, including all the lakes in Valley County as important as the ecology is interrelated? Are you monitoring mining contamination into creeks and streams? So a couple of different questions in that. So maybe the first one, what's the best way to work with the waterways management group? I'm going to say, Darina's going to say, sign up. Uh, use the links posted in the chat. You can get involved there. Um, the Valley Soil Water Conservation District, um, that's going to be a great pathway to get involved. And then I'm assuming, like, stay tuned from the county and its work with Logan Simpson to hear more about opportunities to provide input. Um, I see some light nodding among the panelists, so I think I'm on the right track. And um, I'm going to say that's answered. Um, and then part two is that, uh, is there any monitoring work um, involving um, mining, contamination in creeks and streams? And actually, I'm going to jump back. I feel like there was a lot of comments earlier about Warm Lake. 
and um, whether or not Warm Lake is considered a part of this watershed, and people had some interest there. Um, can anybody speak to whether Warm Lake is being monitored or is it included in, in this waterway, North Fort Payette kind of watershed? I, I can speak to that a little bit on DEQ's side, at least. Um, the, the way that DEQ functions essentially is that we, we do kind of initial monitoring on a lot of water bodies around the state. And then we, uh, based off of the information we get from that initial monitoring, uh, that, that's how we decide whether or not we need to delve a little further into it. At this point, uh, I don't know of any monitoring going on at Warm Lake. Um, and some, some concerns have recently been brought up um, over there. And uh, as far as whether or not it's part of this watershed, I was trying to uh, scramble to look up my map real quick, but I do believe it falls within, um, at least within the, the South Fork uh, uh, Salmon River area. Um, and so even though it's outside of this watershed, it, 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 does, uh, it does still fall within, I believe the, the county boundary. So uh, I think it's still an issue that um, is relevant to the, the counties up there. Correct. Yes, it's still in, it is in the county. So Warm Lake will be part of the Valley County Water Waste Management Plan. But it, yeah, it looks like Dean just um, left messages. It's in the salmon watershed. So. Excellent. Mystery solved. Look what happens when we come together. Um, great, thanks. Um, any uh, Chase, you're going to add something else? Oh, well, I just I was going to try to speak to the mining contamination as well. Um, uh, again, that kind of initial monitoring we do sometimes uh, happens in streams and creeks that are influenced by mining. Um, but actual active mining operations uh, within their permits, they are re typically required to monitor. Uh, for water quality, different water quality parameters. So um, that's something that I think occurs within our, uh, our point source program. And so uh, if you're looking for more information on that, you, you may look at our website at our, our point source in the IPDS program. Excellent, thank you, Chase. Um, and Sherry Maupin has shared that the Idaho Department of Commerce and Tourism Division would have numbers on dollars from tourism and recreation in the area. Thank you, Sherry. Um, any other questions from our attendees? There's about 72 of you still hanging around, so. No. All right, Bethany, how about what's your favorite invasive species and why? Oh my gosh, my favorite question. Now, um, hydrilla, anyone who knows me knows that I'm the hydrilla queen. And what this plant is, is it's an aquarium plant that's uh, very hardy. It's supposed to be found in warm water regions in Idaho with our special uh, surface waters with the interfaces with geothermal waters create this breeding zone that they can they can encompass and what we found with hydrilla is that there are occurrences of tilapia everywhere we found hydrilla in the state. Um, right now we had a detection in Boise we have found no plants there in the last five years. We won't call it eradicated until nine years go by because the tuber that it sprouts from can decide to emerge at any time during that period. Um, but we are happy to report the Bruno River, which was a 14 mile stretch that emptied into CJ Strike. Last year, we found three plants total. And that is, that's 99.8% decrease from original infestation. And so we are hoping that this year could be the year, even though I just said it out loud. So it just jinxed us. But so yeah, if you guys uh, wanna know about Hydrilla, give me a call. <laughs> Excellent. And um, thank you. I was also wondering if any of our panelists had a thought that they didn't get to finish or um, if, you know, something's occurred to you that you'd like to share with the greater group. Uh, now is the time. We have you here. Um, Gary? Yes, Judy. Uh, I had a question for Leonard about um, what happens when the cyanobacteria goes downstream. 
um, does it affect, or can, is there a possibility it can affect irrigators crops? Uh, yeah, I saw a presentation uh, down at DEQ about a year or so ago, and there was a study that had been done uh, that showed that cyanotoxins uh, can actually stunt the growth of crops. So it's something that I think they're still looking into how much it affects, but it looks like there is an effect on uh, crop growth. And unfortunately, the problem is that if a farmer sees that his crop isn't going to grow, he generally adds more fertilizer, which which could create another problem. So um, I'm hoping that more studies come out and, and we really find out what's happening there. And Chase, you might be able to, I, I know Brian Reese is actually the, the person who's probably following that the most, but you might be able to comment on that as well. Yeah, I would, I would just say there's, there's been a lot of studies done on it. Um, of which you can, I think you can find a lot of them on uh, Google Scholar or something. Um, I don't know of any that have been done in, in Idaho uh, to date. DEQ doesn't do any studies on that. And as far as I know, the Department of Ag hasn't done any uh, Idaho specific studies either. This is Brian with Idaho Power. I think according to what Leonard and Chase were saying, there there is, uh, some scientific evidence out there that shows it may impact crops. There's a, a company uh, that manufactures a product based on uh, on that concept. And if you want to know more about it, I don't know how much they have on their website, but it's Agra Max with two X's, A-G-R-I, I think hyphen M-A-X-X. -X. And they produce uh, an instrument that to the best of my understanding, because I investigated, uh, called the company, they invest or they uh, develop an instrument that sends out a, a frequency, a radio frequency specific to a genera of algae and it disrupts the enzymatic processes and kills that algae. Uh, they, they say that it's been successfully implemented on hundreds of golf course ponds around the country uh, when I was talking to him, he said he came back from a farmer uh, around Portland and put it in, in his drain supply water, and he went from two years of corn per stalk to five years of corn per stalk. So there is some uh, utility, I think, uh, according to them, in the golf course industry, the, uh, the ag industry. Uh, they were soliciting Idaho Power because it can be used for blue-green algae. And we were looking into possibly ordering one unit and having it configured for the three most common blue-green algae that tend to go toxic on Brownlee and put it down at Woodhead Park. Uh, so if you wanna know more, I have kind of told you everything I know, <laughs> um, but uh, there are some evolving technologies out there. And one thing that uh, they had told me was few years ago, I forget how many years ago, uh, someone up in Canada used it to eradicate carp. It killed all the carp, but didn't kill any trout. And they were telling me that someone in Idaho, and I assume it has to be Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, was planning on using them in Lake Lowell to kill carp. So a lot of information out there. I think a lot of it is hearsay, uh, but Agrimax, you may want to, uh, if you're interested in, in looking more into uh, the effects on agricultural crops and potential control measures. Uh, look at their website. Um, I just want to say that I, I was, thank you for that. I was more interested perhaps in the fact that um, downstream users and irrigators have a real vested interest in the water quality in Cascade Lake and Lake Payet Lake also. So I just was trying to establish that connection. Thank you, Leonard and Brian. Uh, uh, Judy, to your point, uh, we have a question from, or a statement from Monterey Pepper. Uh, cyanobacteria in Cascade causes a potential risk for the horseshoe binge drinking water. 
as their intake is in the Payette River. Any, any comments on that? Um, yeah, so so I would say uh, be, beyond the, the impacts to agricultural uses downstream, maybe some of the more immediate and uh, concerning impacts could be to uh, recreational users and uh, of course the drinking water uh, in Horseshoe Bend. And so um, DEQ has monitored at times when we've, when we've noticed blooms uh, near the dam, we've monitored as far down as Horseshoe Bend to see if uh, uh, we can detect any cyanobacteria as well as cyanotoxin down that far. I believe we've yet to find any toxin uh, down in that area. Um, uh, however, we, we have seen cells in the water uh, down that far, whether or not the source of those cells was Cascade Lake, we, we haven't determined that yet. So, um, but yeah, I, I think maybe a more immediate concern is, is to uh, recreational users on the North Fork of the Payette, uh, as well as uh, the drinking water down in Horseshoe Bend. Thanks, Chase. Um, uh, Sherry Maupin uh, wanted to share the South Lake Recreational Sewer and Water District should be invited into this conversation. And I know Leonard, uh, you've mentioned them a couple of times. Can you speak to that? Yeah, Friends of Lake Cascade attend quite a few of their meetings throughout the year. And uh, they actually have some relatively new board members who are really interested in helping. And it's a matter of, of helping them understand what they can do because they have certain limitations and then uh, being able to provide them resources and rallying around them. But I, th I think they're, they're gonna play a valuable role in the next year or so, especially when it comes to dealing with uh, septic systems. I, I think the actual implementation of a full scale uh, sewage treatment system probably won't happen in my lifetime. It's something that will probably happen at Lake Cascade someday, but I, I don't know how, how far in the future that is. But uh, we do need to get a lot of information out about septic systems because I have neighbors, in fact, I'm on a septic tank and I have neighbors that didn't realize you're supposed to have them pumped out. In fact, when the water went down the toilet, they thought it was gone forever and they don't realize like, uh, um, Peter uh, Adams said last week that they only have septic systems only have a, a certain useful lifetime. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Well, um, so our Q and A is open right now. So um, again, going back to the panelists, does anyone have anything they want to share or any other thoughts? Hey, can I say one more thing? Uh about Payette Lake. Um, so I think there was, I've gotten questions regarding cyanobacteria blooms in Payette Lake. And so I wanted to make a few clarifications there. Um, you know, we had reports of, um, of these algae blooms this past summer. And uh, we looked at those on a couple different occasions and we did find uh, different types of green algae in the water. Um, but I wanted to clarify that we didn't have any indication or any proof that there was any cyanobacteria in the water, which is very different from green algae. Um, so I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, I had said that there wasn't any toxic uh, forms of this algae. So mostly odor causing green algae, not uh, the blue green algae that we see down in uh, Cascade Lake. And then in regards to any maybe historical uh, imagery or that's shown in some of those tools that EPA's produced. Uh, keep in mind those tools are typically looking at chlorophyll A and not uh, a more specific, which is, which is found in green algae and blue green algae um, and not specifically like uh, phycocyanin, which would be specific to cyanobacteria. So uh, if you're seeing, you know, information showing that there's put a bloom or so in Payette Lake, um, I mean, feel free to contact me, but also keep in mind that that, that could be a detection of, of a regular green algae bloom, uh, which, which is definitely less harmful uh, as uh, in, in terms of toxins go uh, than the cyanobacteria bloom. So that was just a clarification I wanna make because I've gotten a few questions.
questions about that as well. Yeah, I think that's actually coming from uh, the Cyan app and also um, the, the DEQ website um, that actually shows the satellite imagery um, that picks up cyanobacteria. So that imagery actually shows cyanobacteria in Warm Lake as well as uh, in Payette Lake. It's from the storybook on the IDEQ website. Yeah, so so I think that that imagery that you're looking at is from the cyan tracker, correct? It I think it comes out of cyan, yes. Yeah. So so my point being is I think there's a there's maybe a little uh, clarification that needs to be made that, that that data is is using chlorophyll A as its indication of cyanobacteria, which is which is a pigment that's also picked up in green algae. So I'm my point is, um, you know, at this point at least in Payette Lake, we have no uh, physical evidence or observations of blue green algae, um, but potentially we do with green algae, and it might be the same in Warm Lake. Um, so I'd, I'm just trying to make that clarification to avoid. Uh, kind of some panic that there might be blue green algae uh, in Payette Lake and, and uh, Warm Lake. Thanks, Chase. This is definitely this is a panic free workshop. That's what we're going for. Um, let's see. We've got, um, oh, I may have one question. Um, it says Can the Cyan app differentiate between different types of algae? To my knowledge, no. It, to my knowledge, the Cyan app uses both chlorophyll A and uh, the blue pigment in their camera, their optical camera, to determine cyanobacteria. And um, they have an estimate of concentration. All right, thank you, Leonard. Um, so with no further questions or comments, I think we're gonna go into our wrap up. Um, I wanna say thank you to all our panelists for joining us and thank you to giving us your morning and uh, your expertise. Um, this session has been recorded and you can find it on the website for the Valley Soil and Water Conservation District. That's been shared in the chat. And then you can also go there if you're interested in signing up to join one of the work groups. And again, these work groups haven't been like perfectly defined, but they're going to kind of address some of those general topics we've talked about throughout the summit. And your involvement will help us define what happens with them and how they work. Um, and again, you can go to the website and there's a link in the chat directly to the work group and you can sign up for more information there. Um, we want to, again, thank all our panelists, thank all the panelists from all the past workshops we've had so far, and thanks to our sponsors, the McCall, Donnelly, and Cascade Chambers of Commerce, Valley Soil and Water Conservation District, Moppin Homes, the Star News, the McCall Cascade Store, Big Payette Lake Water Quality Council Incorporated, Pam and Ralph Thier, and Friends of Lake Cascade. If you or your agency are interested in becoming a sponsor for future events, please contact Darina Farr at the Valley Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and so that is us. My name's Gary Thompson. Thanks for joining. And thank you to Mackenzie Kramer for helping out on the back end of things. And um, yeah, y'all take care. <laughs>